night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put them in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you. Just gone six o'clock on Thursday the 28th of March. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Here are your top stories this morning. You ready for this? Starmer praises Bojo ahead of Labour's local election campaign launch today. Sakir says that Boris Johnson had absolutely the right idea on levelling up but blames his successor Rishi Sunak for killing the policy. What a mess. See what you did there. Sewage pours into England's rivers and seas. More than 3.6 million hours of spills were recorded. That's double from the previous year. And extending the hand of friendship, His Majesty the King's Easter message stresses the importance of caring for one another. It's his first address since the Princess of Wales' cancer diagnosis. And once again, another windy and wet day for many parts of the UK. Even some snow out there this morning. I have all the details in the forecast a little later. Cheers, Naz. Now it's time for the headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. Two bodies which were trapped in a pickup truck have been recovered from the river in Baltimore, where a bridge collapsed on Tuesday after a cargo ship crashed into the structure. Rescuers have been looking for six construction workers who were repairing it at the time of the incident. But divers are no longer able to safely search the waters because of concrete and debris. Well, the Maryland governor, Wes Moores, told those affected that his thoughts are with them. Today, we transitioned from search and rescue to recovery. We need to bring a sense of closure and comfort to the families, and we take that very seriously. And to all the families, I say, estamos contigo, ahora y siempre. UK nation to legalize assisted dying if a bill is passed through Holyrood later on. Two previous attempts to get the law through have been rejected. Supporters say that terminally ill people should be able to choose how they die, but those against it worry some might feel pressured into ending their lives. The government says it's increased prison staff levels after an undercover Times reporter was hired to work in a jail just three weeks after he applied for a job in one of Britain's most dangerous prisons. The reporter then found he often wasn't scanned and searched when he arrived at HMP Bedford for work. We're being warned about long delays with more than 14 million journeys expected over the Easter weekend. The RAC says journeys on popular routes could take twice as long as usual as the bank holiday weekend leads into a two-week holiday for many schools. And the King's Easter message is to stress the importance of friendship, especially in a time of need. The audio recording will be played at this year's Royal Maundy service at Worcester Cathedral, but the King won't be there because of his ongoing cancer treatment. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update in an hour. My little sunshine newsreader, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Thank you, Jeremy. How are you? I'm all right. Uh, we've had a very interesting discussion this morning about drink. You don't drink, do you? Well, no, I do. I have the odd glass of Prosecco now. I was a big drinker before I got pregnant, Were and you? now I don't miss... Yes, a big, big drinker. And it turns out that... I'm not wrong about Emily Rose Adams. All sweetness and light <laughs> and works out. Beautiful husband, everything sculptured and perfect. You were a bit of a drinker in the past, weren't you? Emily 1.0 was, yeah. But... <laughs> Emily 1.0. We've got, yeah, oh, we've got we the updated version. Maybe. Oh, Maybe see, yeah. that's, a, that's a good thing. Uh, welcome to uh, Thursday, my friends. Welcome. Nearly the end of the week for us, but thank you for tuning in. Apparently there might be snow today. What's happening with the world? I don't know. But apparently... well. No, Naz said this the other day. It's more likely to snow in the month of April than it is over Christmas time. Great. Uh, shout outs this morning. Would love your involvement, please. The local elections are on their way. Sir Keir Starmer, I have to be very careful here. Go on. Is somewhere today. Um, <laughs> he's, uh, he's, he's hiding launching, somewhere in the UK. Or... He's launching the uh, Labour Party local manifesto, but we can't say where he is. No, he's somewhere in the West Midlands, but we don't we know exactly where. We can't say that. No, you can. 
I, I, oh, I've been he's reliably, somewhere in the West Midlands. I've been reliably... This is like Anton Deck. Where's the sofa? Go and find it, isn't it, on Saturday Night Takeaway? Someone find Keir Starmer. He's behind the sofa. Uh, but we've asked you this morning, will you be voting in your local elections? You can email us, talk today at talk.tv. You can tweet at talk.tv. Or you can text talk plus your message to 8722. Something I actually think is disgusting. I know Nick shares it. I think it is an absolute scourge. Is mm. water companies and this disgusting sewage all over our, our country, our rivers, our seas and these water bosses being paid millions of pounds worth of bonuses and their companies are a disgrace. We're asking, should water companies be stripped of profits over sewage crisis? I absolutely think so. What do you think? Talk today at talk.tv. Text to 8722. Well, moving on now, Sakia Starmer has praised Boris Johnson. Don't sound so surprised. I am surprised. It's a Why? surprising thing. This but... is, let me tell you what this is. This is him desperately, well, not desperately, this is now we're going to try and shore up the red wall. Now, everybody wants. He wants every vote. <laughs> well, we'll see. Uh, yes, he has praised Boris Johnson for his efforts to level up Britain. The Labour leader said that the former PM had the right idea and accused Rishi Sunak of killing the policy. Now, Sakir, as we said, is launching his party's local election campaign today in the West Midlands, where he's pledged to tackle alienation and powerlessness amongst much of the country. What does that mean? Well, we'll find out, because joining us now is Talk TV reporter Hurrah! Victoria Innes and former Labour advisor Mike Buckley. Well, good morning, Victoria. Um, morning, Michael. We had Rachel Reeves morning. praising... Thatcher only a couple of weeks ago, mm. and now we've got Starmer praising Boris Johnson. It's very interesting. Yeah, exactly. I think it will raise some eyebrows among the public for sure. Um, you know, essentially what he's saying today is that Boris Johnson was on the right track. He had some good ideas. The sort of backbone behind it was a good idea. Then in comes Rishi Sunak and sort of takes a bulldozer to it all. Um, you know, not enough devolved power to the regions, to local authorities, um, you know, and he's essentially taken away that hope. And that's something that he's going to really focus on when he's out in the West Midlands later today. Um, and, you know, obviously the Tory camp, Michael Gove levelling up secretary, rejecting that claim. He's saying, look, the Tories have made progress. But we did receive a report earlier this week saying only 10% of the money that was meant to go to levelling up has actually uh, reached those areas. And that, um, you know, progress, uh, you know, they promised to reduce inequality. Ministers were unable to provide any examples of what levelling up funding has actually delivered so far. And they blame things like a lack of cross Whitehall coordination between the departments. I think it's really interesting because, of course, if we can bring Mike in. Mike, I want to get through a variety of subjects with you and Vic, uh, as does Nick in the next few minutes. Um, I know that most people will say that Boris Johnson won the election in 2019 because of Brexit, won the election because Corbyn was, frankly, a disgrace. I do think the levelling up thing that he talked about resonated with a lot of people north of Watford Gap. And I actually think Starmer's right. I do think it'll raise eyebrows. But I do think as a country we need to look at it. I mean, I spent, as Nick knows, she lives born in Blackpool. I spent 15 years in Manchester. I'm still amazed that so many people have no idea that there really is a whole country north of the M25. And I'm being honest, pal. No, I think you're quite right. And I, I do speak to people in London quite a lot who don't seem to realise there's the rest of the country out there or know what it's like, uh, which is a bit odd, really. But it's just a fact of life, I think, in our country. You know, that North Gas is South Divide really does is real. But to, to take your point on the election, you're absolutely right. I mean, there was polling around at the time and shortly after the 2019 election showing that delivering up was a big driver for people voting Conservative in 2019. But it, it has got into, you know, history that it was all about Corbyn not being electable, which was true, and it was all about Brexit. But actually, levelling up was in there because five years ago, people knew the NHS was, NHS was up to scratch. They knew that their local area hadn't had the investment that it needed for nearly 10 years under previous Conservative governments. You know, they knew that we needed more policemen and women, that we needed more nurses and doctors. So people voted for those things because Boris Johnson was selling them. But what Boris Johnson didn't do was get into power and then do those things. You can argue to a degree that that was because of the pandemic, but actually they just never really put a plan together. As the reports that um, your reporter referred to a couple of minutes ago showed, they promised leveling up, they never actually got around to doing it. Had they done so, the politics of this country now would be completely different, or it could be completely different, because if people did see yeah. leveling up would work, some big change in their local areas, mm. they'd feel much more like voting Conservative Mikey, right now. Um, Mike, I'm sorry, no, no, go on. Just go ask. Don't feel I just wanted to say, today they launched their election campaign, the Labour Party. You're, you're an ex-Labour advisor. Nick makes a great point. Reeves was quoting Thatcher. He's quoting Boris. 
as a Labour vote. Labour voters, what do they need to hear from, from him today? What does he need to say? Meat on the bone. I mean, bringing up Labour uh, levelling up, I mean, it is an implicit promise. Boris Johnson, Rishi Sunak, Liz Trust, they haven't done it. I will do it. The Labour Party will do it. And indeed, if you look at the history of, of our country, the Labour Party has been the biggest force for social change in our country, undoubtedly, certainly in the last hundred years of its existence, obviously. So it's an implicit promise, you know, we will do that again. Labour got in in 97, and we transformed the public realm. And Keir Starmer was implicitly saying, if you vote for me, I will do the same thing. And what he's also saying is, I won't make promises to you like Boris Johnson and then let you down and not fulfil them. You can trust me to fulfil my promises. But he is also, you're right, giving compliments to Boris Johnson by saying, hey, the guy had the right idea, he just didn't follow through. I think it's fair enough when, when politicians go across their party lines and actually compliment the other side for, for the good that they have done. But Vic, do you think people actually see a difference between local elections and general elections? Mm, or do right. you think the majority of people just go, I'm going to vote blue or red or whatever colour? Do they think that there is a difference between the two kinds of elections? Well, I think obviously everyone is looking at these local elections as kind of an indicator of mm. what's going to happen when it comes to a general election, sure. whenever that might be. But obviously for local people at the moment, they're really worried about things like the cost of living crisis, mm. local GP appointments, the NHS. So those local Pot issues. Holes. Exactly. Bin collections, potholes. Pot holes. Sure. And it's like, do you vote, do you have a, a party maybe that you trust more to deal with those kind of issues? Well, exactly. Really good point. But, yeah. but also I think, you know, 2019 Boris Johnson, obviously people saw Boris Johnson, they saw the character. So they yeah voted for their local election candidates because it was a vote ultimately for Boris Johnson. And I think that's where there may be a difference here. Um, and, you know, we'll have to wait and see what happens. But obviously, you know, Rishi Sunak is quite worried about these local elections. He is worried about what that could mean for the party and ultimately, you know, what, what it could mean for a general election. What you've got is you've either got people who are quite right who are going to come out and go, right, who's my local candidate, yep. right? Or, Mike, they're going to go, right, this is a protest. I'm going to make a little bet with anybody that wants it. Mike Buckley, I reckon that the Tories will be decimated in these local elections by the people that come out, and I believe there will undoubtedly be a, a leadership challenge. However crazy this sounds, heard this from too many people, I absolutely believe that when they come back from recess and they get battered in these elections, Rishi Sunak will be deposed by the, the, the Tory party that always do it to their own. What are your thoughts, my friend? I mean, it seems, you know, pretty much certain the Conservatives will do very badly in these local elections. The last ones were held in 2021, so a year later than they would have been because of the pandemic. The Conservatives then were pretty popular because we just got the vaccines, if you remember, so they had a vaccine bounce in the polls. So, of course, three years on, they're now incredibly unpopular, almost, you know, the most unpopular they've ever been. It's inevitable, therefore, they're going to do pretty badly. Uh, in these local elections because of the difference between those two poll ratings and, of course, the stratospheric rise in, in the, in the Labour poll rating. So whether there'll be a leadership challenge in the Conservative Party, I do not know and I couldn't tell you. Uh, it's not my place to advise the Conservative Party what to do, but that would seem mad. I mean, they've had, you know, three prime ministers already in this parliament and it made six, I think it is, since um, 2010 when they first got elected, which is a huge number. I don't think they're probably going to think any differently of, of them if they have another leadership election, other than to think this is a party out of control and more obsessed with its own internal makeup and its own internal psychodramas than it is in serving the country, making our lives better. Uh, Victoria, um, Angela Rayner, Deputy Labour leader, is to be reinvestigated over council house claims. Can you tell us what the latest is? Yeah, so this has been going on for a little while now. It's about the sale of her 2015 home. Um, and whether, you know, she should have paid capital gains tax up to around about £1,500 on the sale of that home. Now, Angela Rayner says that it was her principal residence and therefore she didn't have to pay tax on it. It was referred originally to Greater Manchester Police after it um, appeared in an upcoming book, uh, this allegation. They investigated. They said they were, they were certain that there was, no, uh, you know, no wrongdoing here. The Tories went back and said, look, you failed to investigate and speak to her neighbours. You didn't look into the electoral role. You need to go back and do some more due diligence. Due, 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 Diligence. Diligence. Yeah, I can't say <laughs> and that. investigate you, again and, you know, make sure that nothing, uh, no wrongdoing has been committed here. So that is what's going on now. Greater Manchester Police said they will investigate again. Uh, Angela Rayner says it's a smear campaign put forward by the Tories. She said she got tax advice. They said there was no capital gains tax to pay. It's, it's really interesting. If I can bring Mike in, we were talking about this earlier and I didn't know this. Uh, and I have a, I, we have to have both sides, Mike, if we've got to be honest. She wasn't an MP, she was a registered carer. That house was the house in which she got 
the registration of her caring benefits. Here's what we're going to say. Of course it's dirty politics by the Tory party, because they are desperate. It happens on both sides. But if you are going to be, Michael Buckley, the Deputy Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, potentially, unfortunately, this is what's going to happen. And this is the ugly side of potentially being in government, isn't it? It is. And, I mean, clearly people, somebody clearly on the Conservative side has raked through the records, probably not only of Angela Rayner, probably of all or most Labour MPs, possibly many of the candidates as well, looking for something they can dig up to sure. throw, you know, something they can throw And let's the make side. the point, but please. Is, if there's an off. investigation and she's innocent, she will be found innocent, absolutely. But what I'm saying is this is going to happen, Mike. It's going to happen. It will happen. I mean, personally, in one way, I mean, I, I don't like the fact that poor Angela Rayner is being hounded by this because it's been investigated already. And from the evidence I've looked at, it seems to be an open and shut case. The only good thing you can say about this being investigated is it will draw a line under it. Because, if you know, I, I assume that everything will be fine and she'll be found innocent and having done all the right things. And therefore, this story ought then to go away. Very interesting. Uh, she is still my political pin-up, Nick. Well, OK, we can move on to something else now because uh, Rishi Sunak has spoken out about the challenges of balancing that professional and personal life, hasn't he, Victoria? Very briefly, being a dad, yeah. Exactly. He said, like, I'm sure a lot of people feel that, you know, the biggest challenge um, of being prime minister um, is, is balancing that with the needs of being a good father. And that's the toughest part of the job. And it's in a new podcast um, for The Times. He's talked about everything from what it's like to be prime minister to advice for his predecessor. But a lot of what people have picked up on is this line about the struggles uh, of being a good father to his daughters and being a good prime minister for the country. Um, Vic, Mike as well, I really appreciate the early start. Um, just, I, I don't know, I, just, I feel like saying, mate, honestly, nothing's going to work. <laughs> Perhaps here's not going to work. A podcast about being saying a dad. Saying you have McDonald's. And all those people who go, you're being really unfair to Rishi Sunak, Jez. No, 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 no. He wanted the damn job two years ago. It wasn't even his mandate. Deal with it. Fact. Right. Thank you so much to Mike, Victoria Innes, um, former thanks. Labour advisor, Mike yeah. Buckley. Let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages now. It is our top story today. In the Times, Sir Keir Starmer takes inspiration from Boris Johnson's 2019 <laughs> pledge to level up as a Labour leader launches his party's local election campaign today. I told you the comeback will be on. The Mail braces us for a summer election as the paper reveals that Rishi Sunak is under mounting pressure from his aides. Right. And a thank you from the King. Yeah. The Telegraph leads on the monarch's Easter message, focusing on extending the hand of friendship. Right, just gone quarter past six, Thursday morning. Moving on now. This is a really, really, really important subject. Mm. Last year, the amount of sewage spilt into our waters hit a new record. 3.6 million hours, hours of raw sewage was pumped into our rivers, into our lakes and into our sea. And that, my friends, was double the year before. Disgraceful. Unbelievable. Well, to break that down, it works out as an average of almost 1,300 spills a day across wow. England alone. Well, sewage companies have blamed heavy rain. I, I, I am so on this. I, this yeah. annoys me so much. It's Joining us now, delighted, water campaigner Ash Smith. Ash. Um, a very good morning to you. I consider this an absolute disgrace to this country. And, and we've heard about it for months, my friend, and lo and behold, it's now front and centre because there's an election. It really isn't all down to ba bad weather. And just very quickly, why it worries and upsets people environmentally, yes, and then you hear these water companies paying £4 million bonuses to their, to their bosses. It's a disgrace, Ash, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a culture that's been known about for a very long time. Somehow, water company bosses have really milked this system. So have their shareholders. They've taken about £72 billion out, out of our bill payers' money, actually, in, in exchange for delivering precisely nothing in terms of their own equity. So it has been nothing more than probably the environmental scam of the century. And that's really, that part of it is starting to unravel now as uh, some economists and accountants get to look at the at the facts as companies like Thames Water teeter on financial collapse. This is how ridiculous it is. How can you go broke with a guaranteed massive income from bill payers who've got no choice but to go to your company? Absolutely. And what are the current rules and regulations around sewage spillage, Ash? Because we understand that even when some water companies are acting within the realms of the law, it doesn't necessarily seem to be very ethical. Well, it's, it's quite simple. They're only supposed to dump untreated sewage in exceptional circumstances. The permitting of the Environment Agency has, has distorted that slightly so that they generally have to spill after they've 
treated about three times the normal dry flow that they would they would get in. We know that companies frequently cut that short. They, they do something called flow clipping, which is not treating enough um, before they dump it. And they also spill it in dry conditions. And that's because their systems are leaky. They get groundwater into their pipes and they spill for groundwater infiltration, which is actually an illegal aspect identified by the Environment Agency. So water companies have become reliant on being able to break the law, get away with it, because most of the time they're not killing large numbers of dead fish. It's that insidious drip drip of uh, damage to public health uh, and more intensely to the environment. And many people have seen their rivers fall off a cliff over recent years from beautiful, once beautiful places to quite miserable and gray slabs of water now. I think, I think you're absolutely right. And Ash, I, unavoidable. Ash, I moved to the sea. Uh, a few months ago, and it doesn't matter where it is, and you can see it, I was saying uh, to Nick this morning, uh, about a mile down the coast, uh, and you can see it, and it is an absolute disgrace. And what I find astonishing is, and we'll come back to government, of course we will, this isn't just overnight. We can talk about the effect on the environment and wildlife. It's been going on for ages. You can take out the money situation. You're right, this is a, this is a scam. What needs to be done? How do we bring these water companies to task, my friend? I think there's one very simple principle. If you can take profit out of pollution, and this applies across the board, really, companies don't do things that are not profitable. Make that step. Stop it being a profitable activity. Stop it being a bonus fest for chief executives to basically cheat. And, and let's get back to delivering a service, not creating financial vehicles for the extraction of money from the, the public, the bill payer. Let's get them back into providing an, a, an essential in infrastructure, which is now the lack of that is even now holding up housing, which is the, the, the next story to uh, really break, I think. And Ash, it's not just sort of raw sewage and effluent that's been found in our drinking water. I read a report yesterday that said, um, just, there's a huge prevalence of Class A drugs being found in marine life. Also, a prevalence of certain hormones because of, of, of human prescription pills that might have been disposed of in the water. It, it's not just sewage that's going around, is it? Yeah, I think that um, drinking water is generally pretty safe in this country. But the, the, the sewage spills, they contain a, a terrible cocktail. If you go into your uh, average supermarket and look around those laundry shelves and cleaning shelves, just put it into your mind that all of that stuff is going to end up in a river or the sea at some point and a lot of the time it now it will be untreated yes hormones uh, when you get sewage works um, dealing with treatment that contains antibiotics from people because a lot of that stuff passes through the body you're stirring around bacteria with antibiotics and of course you're then just leaving the the bacteria that survive the antibiotics so there's a, a real concern about antimicrobial resistance which is the creation of resistant bugs and this is what people are, are getting inf infected by it's something with in the 21st century we should be just dealing with this responsibly not treating it as a way to make money for people shareholders largely overseas i have to say I, and, and i'm open mouth because I, I feel bad i should have I, we should have been crowing about this a long time ago those those visions that we've had on screen are disgusting your line really got me profit on pollution mm. how popular you can take out, actually, all oh, this is about the environment. It's just disgusting and vile and all the things that we said. Yeah. How popular is the, the movement against this, the support for what you're saying, Ash, amongst people? Well, we've been doing this since about 2017 when uh, the World Wildlife Fund said that the public concern was high but awareness was low, and it, and it is the media that's really got this out. We, with all of the work we've done with government and water companies and regulators, they, that just gets stifled. It's only the media that has get the truth out to the public, and, it's, and I can assure you it's generally the public being given the true accounts by campaigners like Windrush Against Sewage, sewage Pollution, Surface Against Sewage, that is sometimes challenged by regulators and government who just put out fake information to try to prolong and cover up what has been the most disgraceful betrayal of this country by just letting, letting private profit rip us off for so long, but do terrible, ter terrible damage to our country. It was so many places have been destroyed by this. So glad we had you on. Seriously, Thank you, Ash. Ash. Thank it's an you. absolute scandal. I think Dreadful. it's akin to, you know, I wonder if 
the post office scandal, if this yeah. kind of issue were to be dramatised, then I'm maybe not, politicians would respond more you, robustly. You know me, I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not into the green thing and all that, I'm not there, but that, sure. those images... Well, maybe that's the environment for you. That is disgusting. Our yeah. rivers, our lakes, our seas... And even uh, it ends uh, up in, in drinking water. But, but bear in mind what he said, profit for pollution. Yeah. And these bosses are getting £4 million bonuses and there's that sewage, you know... In our seas and our rivers, disgusting. We'd love your thoughts on that this morning, by the way. Talk today at talk.tv, text to 8722. Well, still to come on Talk Today, the Prime Minister admits he struggles to balance leadership and fatherhood. So do I. <laughs> and a Times investigation reveals almost all of our prisons are full with inmates living in filthy conditions. I, I put sewage in the prisons, that would work. Right, well, on the wolf and journalist <laughs> James Bloodworth. Take us through this morning's papers. It's 6.25, it's Thursday morning. Do come back. We'll, we'll still be here. It'd be lovely to see you again. Thanks. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to your talk today. It is 6.27. We'll have the weather in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. Uh, Sue Knight's work-life balance. The PM opens up about struggling to be a good father. That's in the papers next. Well, the Easter getaway is expected to be a busy one. We'll have all the travel advice you need with Simon Calder just before seven. He's a legend. This is interesting. Before nine, we'll look at a shocking undercover investigation from inside Britain's prisons, which unearthed filthy conditions of a culture of violence. There's a surprise. Well, first, let's take a look at the weather with Naz. What can we expect? Snow. Snow, oh, yes. Oh, get lost, man. It's, it's April. Come on. It's no joke. <laughs> Is the rain going? I'm going away. Come on. No, there's rain as well. So, yep, we've got rain this morning. We've got snow. Very strong winds out there as well.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. Rain is the name of the game for the next few days, as well as some snow out there this morning and very strong winds. It's because low pressure continues to dominate the scene and you, you can see lots of fronts are swirling around it. But as we head into the Easter weekend, it becomes somewhat calmer, a little bit warmer and mostly dry before Easter Monday does turn rather unsettled once again for many parts of the UK. So back to the here and now. We've got three warnings in force this morning. One does expire in the next hour or so. There is a a warning for rain for much of today and into tonight for the east of Northern Ireland. Snow warning that expires in an hour across parts of Wales and the wind warning across much of the south coast of England. It's a wet start. There are some areas of snow out there across parts of Wales and the southwest of England, mostly on the grass, not on the roads. And it's mostly wet and slushy. Across Scotland, we see the rain that's already across parts of the south moving northwards into this afternoon. Northern Ireland becoming a bit dry before we see plenty of showers developing across England and Wales through this afternoon. Some of them will be heavy and thundery with the risk of hail. Winds will also be very strong, especially along the south coast. We could see around exposed areas gusts up to 70 miles per hour, but generally around 50 miles per hour. So very wet, very windy throughout today. Now, the area of showers will continue swirling and moving northwards up towards parts of the north of England and Wales overnight and to Northern Ireland. It has been very wet there already. Uh, County Down has received 150% of its average monthly uh, rainfall, so it's going to continue very wet there with more rain added. Uh, for the south, though, it does become somewhat dry, but more showers are likely across central, southern and eastern areas throughout uh, the early hours of the morning and through tomorrow as well. And in fact, the showers are becoming more widespread throughout tomorrow. There'll be good spells of sunshine for many areas, as you can see, but lots of showers. Again, some heavy and thundery. It's another cool day across northern parts of the UK and for Northern Ireland. A little bit milder across parts of the south as the winds become lighter and switch to more of a southerly airflow but there will be plenty of showers again some heavy and thundery times radio sponsors talk tv weather corporal thorpes are bouncing up and down today thanks now it's time to go through the papers right around the wolf and the broadcast journalist james bloodworth morning team Good morning. Good morning are you well for thursday <laughs> very good that's what we like to hear james gonna start with you uh shock front page of the daily mail could Rishi Sunak gamble on a summer election? So, yeah, apparently Rishi Sunak's <laughs> aides are, yes, exactly, are urging him to hold a summer... I mean, this seems like madness. Ur urg urging him to hold a summer general election um, amid fears that Tory rebels will not will step up their plotting to get rid of him. I mean, it's. I think this is, is really unlikely. I think if you look at the polls, Labour's 20 points ahead. Mm. Um, why would that prompt you to go for an election now? It would prompt you to hold off as long as possible. And also these... These Tory plots, I mean, who do they want? Do they want to change the leader again? That would that would see their poll numbers probably go down even more because I think people are fed up with having different uh, Tory leaders thrust upon them. Um, and it just... We I have don't a know. phrase It, it, it seems house, a bit of a strange story. Emma, which is, um, imagine a creek that's had sewage, which happens all the time, spilt yeah. into it, and you're up it without a paddle, that yeah? That's indeed where you, we're she's and, and and I And I take... I don't take pleasure in this, but I've, I've said from day one, this guy wanted this job. He manufactured to get this job by, yet say, getting Braverman, who then upset him by knife and voice. I'm telling you now, there's no way out for him, is there? There isn't. They're in a bad way. They're in a bad way. It, it's partly the end of... Four... Look, I'm, the, I'm their biggest critic as well. Partly the end of 14 yeah. years. People are exhausted. Apathy. The country's exhausted. I think we wrecked... They wrecked the country with lockdown and the pandemic, and all of that has had a significant impact. Rishi Sunak, I don't think, has been a great leader. I don't think he's gathered people no. around him. I don't think he's kind of... You know, he seems pretty isolated out there. It's like a bank manager. But, yes, I, I, you know, he, he, he inherited... I mean, he makes a point, you know, in, in The Times that he inherited a really bad legacy. He wanted the job, Emma Wolf. You can't moan about the conditions if you... I mean, there was a chance. I don't think he has moaned. I think he's just trying to get on with it and doing a pretty bad job. Yeah. All the Tory MPs around him are just, you know... He's pretty They mediocre. will not fall into line. They're constantly agitating for a new leader. No-one is helping themselves. And, frankly, you know, we know who the next Prime Minister is going to be. And why not call a summer election? Obviously, there's many, many points behind Labour, but why not just 
Because I, I, I think because they'll want as much time as possible to try... It's not going to happen, but to try and pull some rabbit out of, out it's of a the hat. the economy, isn't so, it? Yeah, and so, for example, there was a story yesterday about this increase in, in the boats coming from bringing people... People coming over from Europe. Sure. So the Tories would look at that and think, this is an issue we can kind of bang on about for the next few months, even though I don't think it will actually help them. But they'll think that, you know, maybe that will start to turn it around by going on some of those you know, on some of those issues. But, I mean, it's a lost look? cause at this point. Can you imagine the look, though, if we had a week of a lot of crossing leading up, literally leading into a, a sort of June election? I think, look, we had all the speculation about the May. Was it going to be May? And then we got past the date when it could have been May. So now... We're oh, sleepwalking, is it going to be June? though, aren't we? We're sleep yeah. And I never thought I'd sit here after 2019 and say this, but they are sleepwalking to what everybody knows is going to happen. It and whether it's the economy or the boats or the NHS, it, mm. there isn't going to be time. And I think you make a great point about sort of apathy and tiredness mm. after 14 years. Yeah. It was exactly like that in 2010 after mm. Blair. It was. Yeah, everybody went, sure. do you know what? It was, a rev it was like that after Thatcher. Yeah. Um, and 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 I just I just it, as a, as a, as a person who votes and lives in this country, I just want it sorted. Well, there's, yeah. Sorry. So I was don't get saying, me wrong. I don't quickly, like the alternative. There's there's one thing in the story that kind of leaves a bit of a bad taste in the mouth. It says that some of the P PM senior aides are already looking for post-election jobs. I mean, the, wow. the state of the state the country's in. Shouldn't they be focusing on that? But Instead, James, they're just thinking of themselves. But James, so. you know as well as I do. Look at all those MPs. They are all now yep. either resigning to get another job. Uh, attaching themselves to who they think is going to be the next one, milking the next six months so it looks good on their CV. And that's what I'm talking about, this sort of apathy and nothing's happening. Well, yeah, and I was going to say the personal interest element is in there as well. Why would you call an election in the summer when you know you can eke it out? I mean, some of these ministers have very, very, you know, well-paid, lucrative jobs and roles and they'll be preparing their next career path after that. Why would you... Why You'd prefer to wait until November to do that than to, to mm. make yourself unemployed in June. Well, Sunak's not just struggling to be a leader. He claims that he's struggling to be a good father. I believe we've got a clip, I'm being told, of him speaking uh, in the last 24 hours. I've got two young girls uh, who mean the world to me and mm -hmm. obviously doing these jobs, it's... Yeah. It's hard to balance being a good dad and, and doing the job well. And obviously, you, you have to prioritise this job because it's an important job and you're doing it on behalf of the whole country. So, you know, not being there for them as much as any dad would like to be is, is yeah. a challenge. And there's particular moments where that you really feel that acutely because there's something very difficult going on that you just can't be, them, be there for them. That's Rishi Sunak there talking to William Haig uh, for The Times, The Story podcast. Do we feel sympathy for him? I think any parent does. Yeah. And I know, you know, he's talking about not being able to have that time with Krishna and Anushka. Um, call them young, two or three year old. But no, um, <laughs> I, I think. Six kids. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he doesn't know how he's. I know. It, like, I know. It, it is a sacrifice. It is tough. It is tough. It's such a, a juggle. And you don't get it till you're a parent. And when you're not a parent, it's boring. And then you, you're a parent, and you get it. And it is. Quality, though, it isn't is it? blooming hard. But I think what he's talking about, and I love this, he's talking about those moments when you're literally chairing like a National Security Council and you've also just been lying on the floor, you know, kind of with your with your little kid, and you're thinking, hang on a minute, in 20 minutes... And I, yeah. I've done that when you think... Are oh, you being in a like, national security meeting? Yeah, yeah, of course, <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, of course No, have. but that feeling of, OK, in half an hour I'm meant to be on television, but right now I'm, 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 I'm bluey. Like, I feel I'm lying that on when the I get home bluey. And, and somebody rings and, and I've got to take a call and they all want to play, you know, yeah. the 33-year-old wants to and play James, and they all want to play. And, James, being Prime Minister <laughs> is not a job that has, you know, set hours. He's constantly on. Oh, well, you'd yeah. like to think he is. Yeah, I know. I mean, I'm not, you know, a fan of the guy, but yeah, of course, I can sympathise with with the fact that he's got children and he's he's constantly on the on the clock, you know, so to speak. Mm. But then again, soon he'll have all the time in the world to spend. Yes, with him. exactly. And I, and I repeat, you know, and I've got to lose and Lenny Ash. And also, he wanted the job. Yeah, and he yeah. says he any he says any prime minister coming in now needs a good a rest and a holiday before they start. Right. And I thought that was that was interesting because he uh, will be. Do indeed. you not think he's shot himself in the foot a little bit? If he if he wangs on too much about missing his children, people are going to go, well, we'll send you home then. It is 24-7. <laughs> there's wars, there's cost of living, there's everything. But, you know, I guess if you put yourself in there, you're going to have to deal with it. And also the way that Downing Street is set up, you are living on yeah. the job. You're living in the house or the flat above the above sure. the main residence. So I, I think the family, and we've seen this a lot with them taking them up, you know, taking us upstairs and showing us around their family home kind of nonsense yeah. that we had with Cameron and with the Labour leaders as well. But I think there's something uniquely kind of home and work about the whole Downing Street 11 and 10 setup. Yeah. Uh, James, can I we move on? I wonder if he's going to afford childcare. 
What? I just said, I wonder if he can afford childcare. Yeah. It was a joke, Jeremy. It's very, very cynical. Of course he can. Um, <laughs> Times, uh, front page. Almost all prisons are already full, with l fewer than 500 places left in men's jails and conditions said to be filthy with rats and cockroaches. This story uh, in The Times, front page, James. Yeah, so the, 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 a journalist at The Times has done a very interesting piece of undercover uh, journalism, gone into a prison, spent, I think, eight days um, in the prison. One of the most concerning things... As you mentioned, is, is some of the conditions in the prison. So, yeah, cockroaches, vermin, um, but also the security in the prison. So only two, on two of the eight days he worked at the prison, uh, nobody, nobody was even managing the security uh, scanners at the front of the prison, wow. which stops people taking in things like drugs, even potentially weapons. Uh, we do know there's a huge problem. Uh, we already know there's a huge problem with drugs in prisons, weapons being smuggled into prisons. And he was saying, you know, even when the, when the security scanners were being used, staff didn't even know, uh, very rarely knew how to actually operate them. Um, there, were, there were very rarely searches done in the morning. Um, and I think this guy got his job without even being security check. Yeah, so the check hadn't been done. It takes 12 weeks after you... So, so you could have started... He could, he could, he could yeah. literally have the been equivalent. anyone. No, he could have been Good anyone. Good piece of work. What's his name? Yeah. Uh, Paul Morgan Bentley from The Times there. It's outrageous. And also, I'm, I'm guessing, well, so many, so much of the prison service, the majority of it is now run by private companies. So when you think about it, as much as I'm sure there'll be viewers shouting at the moment, well, it's what people deserve. If you're in prison, you deserve bad conditions. Well, there's that argument, but there's also the argument that we, the taxpayer, are paying for this. There are companies, talk about making profit yeah. over pollution. They're making profit over prisons. Yeah. And it shouldn't be. I mean, they privatised... Chris Grayling, I think, it was privatised the probation service, which was a total yeah. disaster. And, and they also say there's fewer than 500 places left in men's prisons. And I think we do need to have a, a big look at the prison system. Yeah. We either we need, to re, need to... We need to rebuild and build more. And that's how, that's you, absolute... how on earth do you get a phone in and out? Phones, Phones and drugs. And I, I, well, I can weapons tell you, as well. I'm you on it. No, I know. I, I, was, I was contacted by a prisoner uh, on social media uh, several weeks ago. Um... And they'd... On a mobile phone. I can't yeah. believe it. I reported it to police. Listen, 8.45 this morning, Vanessa Frake, ex-governor, will discuss more about this. It's a really interesting piece. Prison exposed, they uncover shoddy security, violence and rats. What do you think we should do? Build more, become... Nick's right, you break the law, you've got to go to prison. But it's supposed to be about rehabilitation. Also, taxpayer, come on, we're being screwed. Uh, Emma, mm. I... This worries me. The King's Easter message. Can I just throw this out here? I mean, Nick and I... So you get criticised doing this job. He don't look great in that picture, does he? Bless his heart, the king. Look, I, mean, I don't think it's poorly. I don't think it's easy going through cancer treatment. No, I and mean, I know, know that it isn't, yeah. but I mean, yeah. bless him. I just hope what I'm I trying know. to say I is know. I hope he just I hope he just gets takes his time to get better to this rushing back because he doesn't. It's look not like about that. that. It's about the treatment and how that goes. I, I would have assumed. I, I think, hope you know, so. He's getting. He's getting this week that says he's getting frustrated. He wants to go back to work. Of course, but get he's better. getting he's getting five star treatment. Okay. He's, I'm sure he'll be. He's getting yeah. five star treatment, and I just keep thinking of, and this no criticism of the king, but can we also remember the people who are getting on the bus every day to go to their chemo, or yeah. coming back on their own and being having no support and yeah. having no five star carriages yeah. and this and that and the best treatment, or waiting, just sitting on waiting lists, waiting. Yeah. So let's just remember everybody who's yeah. suffering with cancer. But of course, we wish the king and and Kate. And his message, so this is his Easter message today. He can't attend the Royal Maundy Sir Maundy service you know at, what Worc that is? at Worcester Cathedral. They give Cathedral. money out, don't they? Oh yeah, I think they give pennies. I don't know. I'm not sure. Maundy money on a Tuesday. Who after gives that up? He, the king. How much? Well, Queen Camilla. I don't know how much it is, but Queen Camilla is going to lead the service Sorry, because the king David's can't right. attend. Traditionally, Thursday, that, traditionally the monarch would wash the feet of the of the poor. Uh, but they don't do that anymore. <laughs> no, you, know uh, you go to a foot spa yeah. and have your... Yes, that's what happens. Very interesting. And so he's acknowledging the, the depth of the support that he's received and how much it means to him and Kate, but also acknowledging the challenges and just kind of, I think he's doing what we're doing, which is just acknowledging the fact that a lot of people are going through this and this time of year he wants to reach out to the nation. Well, speaking of Easter and the resurrection, can you quickly tell us, James, why Paul O'Grady seems to have returned. It's I'm being haunted, haunted by Paul O'Grady, says Gabby Roslin and other celebrities. Yeah, I mean, so Paul O'Grady, I mean, yeah, there's there's a story in the mirror, actually, about um, the, the former 80, partner of 18 years of Paul O'Grady saying how much he, he misses him. But in the, in the star also, yeah, yeah, apparently his ghost has, has been coming back to haunt some of his celebrity pals. Mm. I'm sceptical, yes. put it that way. Can I just Quite. say... Um, 
I did my first ever TV audition in front of Paul O'Grady, and Paul O'Grady was quite simply one of the most amazing human Incredible beings man. I've ever yeah. met in my Everybody life. Everybody says... Normal, down-to-earth, proper, proper Scouse legend. I can't no believe it's been a year since his passing. No. 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 Um, we're going to go to a break. I'm going to wash your feet. Why? Because I'm the poor and you're the <laughs> monarch. You wish, Kyle. Well, thank, thank you so much. Let me give you a bag of money and wash your feet. I'll, ta I'll take a bag of money. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Emma and James. They will be back in just under an hour. But you've been getting in touch with your views and opinions you this have. morning. We asked, will you vote in your local elections? Kim says, I think it's time to stop voting for Labour and Conservative. They've been in power for too long. The definition of... Labour haven't been in power, though, have they? Sorry, just to... Well, locally they have in various Oh, I see. I suppose Sorry, what she I've means. got you. The definition of madness mm. is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Give them their marching orders. Lee makes a point that I think resonates with a lot of people locally and worries me nationally. What's the point? Nothing will ever yeah. change. Can't remember when a local council knocked on my door last. I've had plenty of leaflets, though. I think there's your issue about this country right now. And Paul says it's important to vote, even though I yeah. understand the negative feelings. People need to consider history more and the people who fought and died for your rights, presumably the right to vote. Uh, just vote for the best option. At least you can tell your grandchildren you tried. Oh, that's really sweet. I love that message. No, we're Thank not really so naive. I'm bowing down to the great Boris Johnson. Jackie takes this. We have to get this in. Uh, let's not be naive about Labour. Why are they pretending to be Conservative to appeal to the election? Boris had a vision, but he was never, ever forgiven by the Remainers over Brexit. Well, still to come, warnings of travel chaos this weekend as many head off for an Easter break. But the head of the AA, Edmund King, and travel guru, Simon Calder, will tell you how to avoid it and get to your Easter lunch on time. This is Talk Today. It is 6.45. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss you. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back. You've until today, 12 minutes to 7 o'clock. It's Thursday morning. Now, tomorrow, of course, Good Friday, with many of us planning all of us, a getaway and probably dreading the inevitable travel chaos. So if you're planning a road trip, do pay attention, because joining us now is the president of the AA, Edmund King. Good morning, Edmund. Are you expecting long queues this weekend? Of course. Yeah, good morning. Um, we did a survey of 12,000 drivers, and more than half of them said... They are going to do a relatively long trip this weekend, average distance of about 55 miles. But it's quite interesting because the, the, the trend's slightly different this Easter because Saturday, Easter Saturday, is going to be the busiest day and something like 18 and a half million drivers are taken to the roads. And that's a combination of day trips, people going to see family and friends. There's a lot of uh, Premier League football fixtures on the Saturday. Um, so Saturday itself, yeah, we'll, we'll be really busy. Um, it, I, I always have this thing, Edmund, it's great to have you on. I, I spent my entire life going up and down the motorways and, and, you know, whenever it comes to a holiday period, they go, oh, you've got to beat the rush. And it gets earlier and earlier and yeah. earlier. And people yeah. leave at 4 a.m. on Good Friday and they still don't get to where they're going until Saturday night. It's just catastrophic. Yeah. And we can have a huge debate about, you know, timing and the numbers of vehicles. but. Yeah. I don't know whether our roads cope, but honestly, you can't seemingly go anywhere, can you, anymore? Well, I, I think that's the case. I agree. And if you look at things like the M1 at the moment, um, by kind of Luton and uh, Dunstable that way, there, there's about 16 miles of roadworks that yeah. can't really be removed just for a weekend. They're, they're relatively permanent. So people will be hitting that. I think one bit of good news is that it, it does appear that uh, it, the traffic will be broken up a bit. Some people leaving today, some Good Friday, and then, as I say, Saturday, a lot of day trips, uh, and then Sunday. One of the things everyone can do is make sure you're prepared, prepare your car, do some basic checks, check, check the tyres, check your windscreen washer fluid, check your oil. And the other thing we find, particularly when people are traveling to unfamiliar places, if they do break down, more than 40% find it really difficult to explain where they are. They kind of say, oh, I passed a pub. I'm not sure there's a junction ahead. So what we're saying to people, there is a free app called What Three Words, yeah, and it, it divides the globe into three meter squares. And it gives each three meter square three unique words yes. and if you just press the app get those three words if you tell us that you've broken down and you're there or if you've had a crash and you need to tell the emergency services mm -hmm. it can really help to to pinpoint you it's it's, it's a brilliant uh way of us locating you much more quickly it's Edmund, fantastic thank you stay there if you would uh if you are though planning on thinking i'm not going on the roads you're planning on getting a plane or perhaps you're getting on a train if they turn up the, the the guru the legend where is he travel expert simon calder is live <laughs> from where is he oh look at him uh, yep yeah. three words for you liverpool john lennon there we go yes the oh. uh, merseyside <laughs> airport very exciting today, actually, because um, just behind me, Jet 2 has moved in. They've got their first flight going off to Tenerife at 8 o'clock this morning. All very exciting. They're in competition with EasyJet and with Ryanair and with Wizz Air. So that means people in and around Liverpool are able to get a bit more competition. And it's going to be busy here, but goodness, even busier at some of the other airports. So Bristol, Newcastle and Edinburgh are saying they are going to have their busiest Easter ever. It's going to be pretty tough at business airports like uh, London Heathrow today because you've got all the usual business traffic mixing with people who are desperate to get away on holiday. And of course, this is because Easter's so early, 31st of March, you've got loads of schools breaking up today adding to the usual Easter rush. So it's going to be a kind of double trouble. And uh, wherever you're flying, just hope for the best. Be nice to the frontline staff. They're doing their best to get you where you need to be. But uh, be prepared for delays and disruption. And Simon, what's the most popular getaway destination this weekend? Where are you seeing people flock to? OK, so it's the usual suspects. It's Malaga, it's um, Alicante, lots of people heading off to the Canary Islands, particularly Tenerife. In terms of city breaks, Dublin, very popular, Amsterdam, 
Paris um, getting there ahead of the Olympics and long haul New York, Orlando and Dubai are the uh, most popular destinations. Most of them a lot uh, warmer than they are here. We're not seeing any problems actually at the airport so far. And I hope that continues on the railways, though. Oh, my goodness. We're not even at the Easter engineering works yet. And things have already gone, as they say in the travel industry, tango uniform. So let's have a look at the um, great western region between Bristol Parkway and Swindon, the main line between South Wales and London Paddington. That's closed because of flooding. It's going to be delays there. And would you believe, uh, because it's Easter, there's a storm coming in and there's going to be uh, rail disruption in lovely Dorset between Weymouth and Bournemouth from 11 o'clock this morning. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> si, that's where I'm trying to get to at 11 o'clock. Uh-oh. OK. It's uh, all right, you'll get the other car. car. I'll get um, a helicopter. So, I'll get the helicopter. Exactly. Uh, can I just can I just be really honest, mate? I absolutely love you. Tango uniform has to be the best link so far this year. Simon Calder is a legend. Okay. So are you telling me I might as well do this? Can I not get from London Waterloo to Bournemouth, or is it beyond Bournemouth? No, it's beyond Bournemouth. Things are going to slow down quite a lot because of speed restrictions, because of the storm that's going to be powering across what I think well, is... Well, um, the storm, actually... get the helicopter. What am I supposed to do with this rubbish? Can I we... love that you've now turned this into your own personal well, I, how advice am I from get Simon home? Calder. How am I going to get home? <laughs> Summon the driver, for God's sake. Check the wheels. Oh, no, the roads are screwed. What am I going to do? Oh, <laughs> uh, you'll be fine. All right, well, I'll uh, no, get you it's... sorted. Listen, gentlemen, thank you. It is a very, very, very busy time on the roads, the railways and the planes. We really appreciate your time. Simon Calder uh, and also uh, Edmund from the AA. Thank you, Gang, very much. Thank you so much, much both of you. Are you going away? Uh, I am, yeah. I'm going to get the train to Bath on Saturday. So, fingers where? Go Bath. Why are you going to Bath? Sorry, Bath. <laughs> Why are you going to Bath? I'm going to go to the Baths in Bath. Is that what you're really doing? To the spa. Yes, you're I going am. To spa yes, in I Bath. <laughs> now, listen, if you want to be part of the show, my friends, this morning, please do keep it coming. Talk today at talk.tv. Text to 8722. We're asking, are you are you just bored of politics? Are you going to vote in the, gen in the local, local election, election, I should say? Uh, do you have any apathy towards that? And this, I thought it was interesting this hour, should water companies who are pouring millions of pounds of horrible stuff into the rivers and the lakes and the seas, should they be penalised? Your thoughts, please, would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, lots more still to come on Talk Today as the Labour leader prepares to launch his local election campaign. We'll be asking why he's decided to give credit to one of Boris Johnson's flagship policies. I've got to check. Chain table. Come on, crack on. <laughs> check what? Get the train timetable. It is Talk Today. It is 6.56. Am I getting home? Helicopter. All right. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning, it's 7 o'clock on Thursday, the 28th of March. It sure is, you would talk today, my friends, on TV, we're on radio, of course, online, and your smart speaker. These are your Tuesday, no, even Thursday morning top stories. My Brilliant. goodness, well, Thanks. Starmer praises Boris. Ahead of Labour's local election campaign launch today, Sir Keir says Boris Johnson had the right idea on levelling up blames Rishi Sunak for killing the policy. Losing control as 90% of teachers report verbal or physical abuse from pupils will ask headmistress if schools are doing enough to keep their staff safe. And it started with a kiss, but could it end with the clink? Prosecutors seek a prison sentence for the former Spanish FA boss over his World Cup final behaviour. Talk Sports Sam Allard has the latest this hour. And rain again today, as well as strong winds and snow for some this morning. I'll have all the details in the forecast a little later. Cheers, Naz. Now it's time for your headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. Divers have recovered two bodies trapped inside a truck in the river in Baltimore, where a cargo ship hit a bridge on Tuesday. Rescuers have been looking for six construction workers who were repairing it when it collapsed. Officials, they say they're moving from a search and rescue situation to a state of recovery. Scotland could become the first UK nation to legalise assisted dying if a bill is passed through Holyrood later. Two previous attempts to get the law through have been rejected. Supporters say terminally ill people should be allowed to choose how they die, but those against it worry some might feel pressured into ending their lives. Sir Keir Starmer's praised Boris Johnson's vision for levelling up, but says it's been killed off by Rishi Sunak. Writing in The Times with his deputy Angela Rayner, the Labour leader says he'll revive the policy if elected. They've promised something called a take-back control law, which would give powers to local areas. Well, former Labour adviser Mike Buckley's told Talk Today that levelling up is a vote winner. They promised levelling up, they never actually got around to doing it. Had they done so, the politics of this country now would be completely different, or it could be completely different, because if people did see levelling up at work, some big change in their local areas, they'd feel much more like voting Conservative right now. MPs are calling for an increase in statutory sick pay to bring it in line with maternity pay. The Committee for Work and Pensions wants to raise the weekly payments of £110 to just over 170 The government has said it'll increase by 6.7% next month. And we're being warned about long delays with more than 14 million journeys expected over the Easter weekend. The RAC says using popular routes could take twice as long as usual as the bank holiday weekend leads into a two-week holiday for many schools. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update in an hour. Thanks, Em. Yes, uh, so just after 7 o'clock, and as we keep saying, please do get involved with the show. Uh, local elections on the way. Uh, May the 2nd, we asked, are you just fed up with governments in its entirety? Will you vote 
Uh, Florence, I understand there is not too much to vote for with the two, top two political parties, but everyone who has the right to vote should do so. It's no good moaning about the state of the world if we don't try to change things. Cooper says most of us believe that there is no point casting a vote, but truly that would be a wasted vote. Even if we don't agree with the policies of other parties, the only way to bring about change is to get rid of the two-party system and force change in our political thinking. Frida, in all good conscience, I cannot vote for any politician in this country anymore. Time and time again, they have proven themselves as self-serving creatures that care nothing for the will of the people or for the protection and services of my country. If I don't vote, at least I'll be able to live with my decision. And Charlie says, vote for what exactly? It's literally more of the same from several parties. It's a pity that we have reached this level of political homelessness. Talk today at talk.tv, text to 8722. Start your message with the word talk. That, sewage, whatever, it's down to you. We want to hear from you. Well, to our top story now. Sir Keir Starmer has praised Boris Johnson for his efforts to level up Britain. The Labour leader said that the former PM had the right idea and accused Rishi Sunak of killing the policy. Now, Sir Keir is launching his party's local election campaign today where he will pledge to tackle, I don't know what this means, alienation and powerlessness across much of the country. Well... We've got two women here who could probably tell us what it means. I'm outnumbered this morning. You There's women are, everywhere. As you should be. Including my nemesis is in the building <laughs> in black, like a like a like a like a black widowed spider. <laughs> that, yeah. I think that's you. Well, talk TV reporter Victoria Innes is back with us. And we're also joined by political correspondent at Politics Joe, Amos. Twice in one week, mate. You must I be know, short of care. I know, yeah. I'm exhausted. <laughs> Stop calling me. I can't <laughs> get over it. Well, you know what it is. Vic, we're gonna start with you uh starmer praising boris johnson what on earth has happened yeah i think it's an it's an interesting one um but i think there is you know some solid thinking behind it obviously you know um labor are trying to win back all of those 2019 voters who voted for boris johnson who liked boris johnson um and who liked his policy of leveling up and labor and keir starmer angela Rayner are essentially saying look we we see what he was trying to do the backbone of the policy was good um he promised you x y and z you know it was a good idea in theory but he then handed over to Rishi Sunak, who just can't deliver it. But it is really interesting, just to bring Ava in, and I appreciate what you're saying, Vic, but, but Ava, on a serious note for a minute, right? 2019, the Labour Party, Corbyn, you fast forward four and a half years. Last week, Rachel Reeves quoted Margaret Thatcher. Today, Keir Starmer mm -hmm. quoted Boris Johnson. This is a party that has not only parked its tanks on the Tory lawn, it's taken over their headquarters. It's, some of the language is extraordinary for a party that's changed so much in four years, don't you think? Well, the tactics are so obvious, I don't even think it needs much analysis, right? You know, that they're appealing to a base that they, they feel that they lost in 2019. And, you know, they're sort of warding off attacks. So uh, Rishi Sunak, during Prime Minister's questions, he regularly would, you know, call... Keir Starmer a socialist and the best way to ward that off is to say that your economic policy is similar to Margaret Thatcher's you know it, it, it's so obvious I don't even know how to analyze that for you is it is it do they need to do this here's my question Vic does it does the, does the Labour Party in the position it is does it need to do anything more than just exist does it actually need to say anything because the Tories are in such chaos well arguably not I mean arguably all of the votes for Labour are not necessarily a vote for Labour and for Keir Starmer. They are a vote against Rishi Sunak and the yeah. Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. So, you know, most of the polling would suggest that whatever uh, Labour does, they are still going to get those votes anyway. And whatever Rishi Sunak and the Conservatives do, it's not going to make a difference. But the problem is, is that Keir Starmer has got a big problem once he gets into power, because there are a lot of those 2019 voters, those red wall predominantly voters, who do not like Keir Starmer and do not like the Labour Party. And the satisfaction there is very low. So, yes, Labour way, may win when it comes to a general election, whenever that may be. But after that, they have got an uphill struggle to convince people that there is optimism for the future and that the Labour Party has got their backs Couldn't and is going to more. deliver sure. for Couldn't them. Agree more. And Ava, as Starmer's due to launch the Labour Party's local election campaign can't say later where. today. We can't say where, but it will be in the West Midlands Shh. somewhere. Don't. We won't mention where it is, Jeremy. Do not worry. Why can't we say No, that? don't. Shit, I'll get stressed. Shh. Because, we because, can't say. I got told say. not to say. You know what I'm like? I'll say it and then everything will go wrong. Yeah. Don't say. OK. Ava, how will a local election campaign differ to a general election campaign? Well, this is going to be a, a tough set of elections, I think, for the Labour Party because, you know, quite a few Labour councils around the country have either declared bankruptcy or are, you know, uh, experiencing significant financial difficulty. So... Labour are going to be looking at this, hoping to, you know, sort of prove that they'll be able to pick up a few more seats in the general election. But West
West Midlands, where the election is. But I won't, I won't go into detail about where it is, where the campaign launch is, but it's in West, the West Midlands, <laughs> because there are also several mayors who are up for election. Yep. And right. Andy Street is the very popular Tory mayor who is currently sitting. And there are some in the Labour Party who would love to dislodge him. It's really, really unlikely, though. He really is quite popular, on a, on particularly a, because he's rather centrist. On a wider scale, at scale and throwing out what we throw out, but will people vote? One of the things that we've talked about a lot is that I think people are so fed up with, with, with all politicians and what's going on in the country. There is an increased apathy. Does that show itself more at local elections than national ones? Um, well, you know, particularly with the mayor, mayor elections, that's something that Sadiq Khan and his team are really concerned about because, you know, in London, it, it's pretty much a two-horse race between him and the Conservative candidate, Susan Hall. Now, if you've been paying much attention to that campaign, Susan Susan Hall might not be we the woman that every Londoner would like her, to lead here. Uh, yeah, but, you know, the, the big concern that the City Khan's team have is apathy. People will go, look, mm. it's going to be a Labour mayor. Why on earth would I turn up to vote in the first place? And that's and always the problem, isn't it, in elections? If you're that far ahead that people go, do you know what, I won't bother. Mm, right? Yeah. Well, absolutely. And, you know, particularly with local elections as well, if you're really fed up with the council and you're not thinking, you know, maybe the Conservatives will do better, then you might not turn out to vote at all. But also in council elections, you have a much broader uh, choice of candidates. There are a lot of independent candidates that stand. A lot of the time they stand on one mandate, so they yeah, might stand yeah. against planning reform. Mm -hmm. And people going to vote for them actually splits the vote and it reduces, the, you know, the big major parties, what, uh, you know, what majority they might have. Do you think most people even know Who's run, who runs their council, whether their council is, is Labour or Tory run? I think people are connected to I think, I think, people, do, I think to people... It depends on the area, but I think people do, do normally know who their local candidate is, and a lot of people feel strongly either way for their local candidate. A lot of them think, you know, whether there's someone who delivers a lot for the local area or whether there's someone who doesn't deliver. I think even in local elections? I actually disagree with that. I'm not being difficult at all. I'll tell you why I disagree with it, because I think that people look at a local election and they base it entirely what's going on nationally. I really do. And yeah, I'm well, just, that is, I've that never is, met that a local true. candidate, only because I, probably yeah. because I do this job. If I was voting, I would be voting on what I think is going to happen. In I, I, think I, I think it depends as well if it's, if it's a big character. I mean, I think if there's a big local local character yeah, that's true. that Good everybody point. knows who's very involved in the community, then people will know him. But obviously, if that's yeah. not the case, then... And just before we move on to another topic, uh, the full list of candidates who are running to become Mayor of London are Cheyenne Batra for the Independents, Rob Blackie for the Liberal Democrats, Natalie Campbell for the Independent, Howard, Howard Cox for Reform UK, Amy Gallagher for SDP, Zoe Garbutt for the Green Party, Taryn Galati for the Independent, Susan Hall for the Conservative Party, Sadiq Khan for the Labour Party, and Andreas Mickley for the Independent. Sorry, who is running as an Independent, sorry. 10 past 7, can I bring it on to the, the from local elections to the national scale? Rumours that certain people in his inner circle, Ava, are, uh, are saying to Rishi Sunak, go in the summer. Now, I, you and I probably wouldn't agree on all things, but we'll probably agree on this. This country is sleepwalking towards this general election. It almost seems inevitable, right? Mm. Um, it's not going to make any difference when he calls it, is it? I think we've been having this conversation now for for, for too long, and yeah. you know the, the honest the honest truth of it is that Rishi Sunak actually doesn't know when to call the election. Yeah. They actually haven't made a decision. And the second that there's a tiny bit of conversation, one of the special advisers who sat around Rishi Sunak leaks it to the papers. You know, and a lot of the time this is actually being leaked by backbench Tory MPs because they're trying to sort of focus group the country and to see if that date. Would you know would be palpable or you know palatable to the rest of the country? It's probably come from actually I do I, I know exactly who it's come from, but it's come from a backbench Tory MP who Want really would, who really wouldn't actually have a clue to be honest. He would not be in you the insight. I, I don't I, name I, them. I'll, I'll end up having to read every. I'll tell you what. I'll name Tory candidate's name, name out. <laughs> <laughs> right. On that note, Ava Tim Montgomery, a prominent Tory advisor, said. Uh, that a source in number number 10 had told him that Rishi Sunak was mm. openly saying to advisers this in Downing Street, I'm not very good at this. Why isn't anything happening? What? Yes. <laughs> that's, that's so awful. Of a what prime minister mean? I'm cringing. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, but you see, you, you and I would usually disagree. I actually, Vic, I don't think he has been that great. I think he's flattered to deceive. I don't think he's proven himself to be that competent. I really don't. But what do you actually want him to do? Because, you know, the problem that the Conservatives have got at the moment is they're played by short-termism, and the reason that they're played by that is because they know OK, that I'll tell you exactly what I mean. Corner. After so Boris Johnson and Liz, they, they talked about having a steady hand on the tiller. They talked about, you know, somebody who was bank manager Lee, right? And he walked up Downing Street and he said this, that and the other, and I've said this a million times, then he employed... Gavin Williamson, he did a deal with Suella Bravman. He made these promises that haven't happened. And I think people are looking at it and going, you've actually taken this party back. That's what I think. Mm. Well, we're stagnating, aren't we?
Yeah. We're, we're sort of just waiting. We're waiting for this election and there's going to be no actual solid uh, solid policy until then. I think the best thing that we're going to get is probably a ban on smoking for, you know, people who are under 15. Who are too young to vote anyway. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There we go. Well, thank you so much to Victoria Innes and Ava Santina from Politics Joe. Thanks, thank you gang. both. Let's take another look at some of this morning's front pages now. It is our top story today. In The Times, Keir Starmer takes inspiration from Boris Johnson's 2019 pledge to level up as a Labour leader launches his party's local election campaign, Later today. The mail front page braces for a summer election. We're just talking about this as the paper reveals Rishi Sunak is under mounting pressure from his aides. And a thank you from the King, the Telegraph leads on the monarch's Easter message, focusing on extending the hand of friendship. Well, on to another story making the headlines today. A teacher from Wales has been awarded £150,000 compensation after they were physically and emotionally abused by one of their pupils. The teacher, who was working at a school for boys with social, emotional and behavioural issues, was left with injuries to his face, mouth and head after he was punched and headbutted. My goodness. Well, to tell us more about how widespread an issue this is, we're joined now by head teacher Christine oh, Connor. scared. <laughs> Are you scared of being disciplined by... Well, last Mr. time Con she asked me to do lines. And, do you know, I'm, gonna be, I'm always very honest, you don't know why I was scared, do you? you? You know we've met, don't you? I know we've met. No, no, before. I know. I, I didn't know that you were from that school. That's why we've met. I won't go into detail. Yeah, but I didn't ask you to do lines, if you remember rightly. I actually asked you to have a reading list. So have you actually done as you're told? No. <laughs> Incredible. There I you go. Haven't. Now can you give him lines, please? <laughs> now please give him lines. Um, <laughs> look, scary. this is obviously a really horrific yes. incident, mm. but it's not an anomaly. It's by no means a one-off. It's, it's hard to tell how bad this situation is in the UK at the moment because I was looking at a survey done by the NSUWT, which is one of the largest teaching unions, and they did a survey where 90% of the respondents said they had been sworn at or, you know, come across physical violence. But that was only 6,500 and there are over half a million teachers in the UK. So it's very hard to sometimes, you know, what we hear in the media or whatever is through surveys like that, which are not totally representative of the population. Can I go out on a tangent for a reason? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm older than Nick, OK, but a, a lot older. In my day, Nick, just to steer me out, because I'm trying to explain this, you were scared of the police. You were scared of your teacher. We have teenagers who turn up at school and swear and keep their own time. Many teachers have said to me on a very serious note, we have absolutely no control. We're not allowed to raise our voice. We certainly can't do anything else. We'll be reported to the Human Rights Commission or something. Mm. Are teachers being sterilised, neutralised, if you like, because of the way teaching is nowadays? And is that part of the problem here? Have we gone... Uh, have we moved all rights to kids so these poor teachers are impotent? I think there's an element of that. I mean, no one should be scared of anyone. It should be respect rather than being scared of. And I think yeah, that right, element absolutely. of respect yeah. has gone. But, but that comes from a... Not a fear, but that comes from a respect or fear of the rules being... That's what I'm yeah. saying. If a teacher backs down now because of the way the world is, that doesn't help you, does it, as a profession? No, it doesn't. And there's so many rules and regulations that you've got to abide by. But I think if you've got a good school with good structure and good policies in place, and some of the policies that are being used in the country at the moment, I believe, do not work... So, for example, restorative behaviour management, which means sort of negotiating. In my school, we've got very clear boundaries. If you don't want to abide by those boundaries, that's fine, but go and find somewhere else to be here, educated. Here, Do you find that parents here, here. are being cooperative as well? I can imagine that's quite a big part of the issue. It is a part of the issue because every, behind every child's success in school, it's a triangle. It's the child, the teachers and the parents. And if you've got good support from home, it's a win-win. Things are just going to happen. But when you don't have that, and we're seeing more and more of that, that's when things go badly what wrong. What do you mean by that? Well, you might be that if a, a school, for example, gives a child a detention, rather than, you know, if I got a detention when I was young... Well, I didn't, because I would... Of course I you can't didn't. mention... I did, and I would have been yeah. terrified what my mother would have done to yeah, me. Yeah, absolutely. That sense? Even her voice would have scared oh God. me to death. The soup look. But now parents will come back and go, well, I don't think little Johnny should be in a detention. Yeah. And again, that's a case of... Well, look, when you came here, you agreed by our rules and regulations. And again, and we've actually got it written into our policies that if the parents don't support or if they don't, you know, believe in what we do, 
this is not the place for you or your child. And children will lose their places because parents are not behaving. I read a story the other day of um, a teacher had said that they were physically assaulted by a student and they wrote to the parents and said what had happened. And the parents replied by saying, OK, well, we're going to give him a banana on the way to school. We're going to call it the calming banana. And maybe that will try, maybe that will be the thing that stops him from physically assaulting you. But I imagine this kind of thing happens all the time, whereby you're disciplining children and the parents come back with a softly, softly approach and think that there's no way on earth their precious child could have done X, Y, and Z to a Absolutely. teacher. And that's totally misguided and they're making a rod for their own back mm -hmm. and the problems will come later. So those parents, we only have children up till the age of 18. Those parents have got the children for life. Parents behave like that, good luck. But the, the, is it, I love you now. I'm, I'm really not scared of you. No, but, but the point is really relevant. What we're saying to our... I think this is social media. I think this is a younger generation. I, I, I honestly do, Nick. I, I know fear is the wrong word, but if you but... do not respect the police, if you do not respect teachers, if you do not respect the army, because we now live in a world where apparently it's all right not to do that, that is going to have an impact on teachers. They're going to lead kids to attack teachers. That's a fact. Well, the, I think 50% of teachers are thinking of leaving the profession, and we've got a recruitment wow. crisis as we have at the moment. I know schools local to me because we'll get more applications from these schools where there are children in exam halls being taught by one teacher via Zoom because they cannot get the teachers in school and that's because the teachers do, you know, one, it's really hard but the working conditions have to improve for teachers to, in, you know, get teachers back in the classroom in front of children. And there are some schools, I mean, this, this payout of £150,000 happened at a school that is specialised mm -hmm. for children who are violent. So now, it's easy to blow that up and say that's yeah, like it, yeah. And for some of these children, it is not their fault because they have diagnosed, yeah. you know, psychological or otherwise behavioural issues. But what are, what's the government doing or what is the, you know, the school union doing to protect teachers who are on the front line and actually would expect that kind of behaviour in the classroom, a violent uh, retort from a child? Well, I think it's down to, it's down to health and safety at the end of the yeah. day. And in, in, school, in all schools, you have to have risk assessments, you have to have health and safety meetings. So if you've got children potentially in your classrooms that could kick off and hurt someone, there should be measures in place yeah. for that. And I do know people that have worked in it, you know, schools for children with social, emotional, behaviour difficulties, where there are other people present in the room. That teacher should not have been put in danger. There should have been appropriate measures put in place. And if they can't provide that, then that class should not have occurred. I mean, I will always sit here, because I'm 58, and I can and say that it's all gone a bit soft society. But what measures would you like as a teacher to be implemented to make your job easier? My job is relatively easy because I am a firm head teacher of a certain age like you, Jeremy, where I don't stand any nonsense. And I am very tight on health and safety and also employment relations as well because yeah. I've seen the same article that we were referring to that there's many tribunals and things going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. If you do things right, you play by the book, you follow the procedures and you stand firm on what you believe, you won't have those problems. Wonderful. I think you're brilliant. Now, That's what, you what, told. What you don't know is my kids go to a school about 100 yards from her school and if I'd met you, that might have been different. Fair play. And don't. I remember meeting you in the train station a couple of years ago. Oh, there God. we go. There you go. I think, you Small see, I world. have this vision of this scary head teacher. But yeah, I'm sorry, I do think you're right. Yeah. We're making our teachers well, impotent. See, we've learned I... something here. It's not about you being scared of Miss Cunliffe. It's about you respecting her. And respect is mutual, Jeremy. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll see you later. <laughs> are you going to do your reading list now I'm that you respect her? I'm flirting with my teacher. <laughs> are you, are you going to do your reading list now? Can you take me and show me what a, way, a, way a reading list it's is? It's a bit too early in the morning for me for to be flirting with you. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, head teacher Christine Cunner, for joining us again this morning. Come Do come back, so please. <laughs> I bet you have. Well, still to come on Thought today, record levels of sewage oh. are pouring into UK waters and dogs are being trained to sniff out post-traumatic stress disorder. That's so we've gone from crap in the river to that. That's quite an interesting link. And apologies it? for that language there. What? Was offended. Said it on a sign earlier. Writer Emma Wolf and journalist James Bloodworth will be taking us through this morning's papers next. This is Talk Today. It's 7.21 in the morning. It's a big morning. sign. It said cut. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 7.25. We'll have the weather in just a moment. But here's what else is coming up in the programme. Do you want to tell them why you're laughing? Because just as we went on that link, the director went, can I have your dressing room today for a kit? Of course you can. Uh, there are astonishing claims that sewage, this is really, I'm, this is really important, dumps have led to cocaine getting into the system of the UK's fish. That's in the papers. This is disgusting, this story. Well, could jail be on the cards for the former Spanish FA boss, Louis Ruby, sorry, Luis Rubiales, for that kiss? Sam Elot has all your sport before 8 o'clock. Really interested in what you're going to say about that. Before mm. 9, we look into that shocking Times investigation from inside Britain's prisons, which unearthed filthy conditions and a culture of violence. Shock horror. Uh, a former prison governor shares her thoughts ahead of 9. Well, first, let's take another look at the weather with Naz. What's happening? Uh, there's snow out there this, this morning. It's ludicrous, man. It's April. I mean, I, I told you this yesterday. Clearly, you yes. weren't listening. It's statistically more likely to snow. It's what? In April. It's what? Statistically. <laughs> statistically. <laughs> but at Christmas, right? I'm being told yeah, off by the head I, teacher, told off by the weather now. lady. Thank you. I was listening. I'm sorry I wasn't. I'll do some. Do you want me to do some lines? No, there's too much of it in our water systems. Carry on, Naz. In our fish. <laughs> <laughs> Something fishy about that. Let's have a look. Oh. <laughs> Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Very good morning to you. Rain is the name of the game for today and for the rest of the week, although it does become a little bit drier for the Easter weekend and a tiny bit warmer, but not bone dry. There will still be some wet weather about. It's all thanks to the fact that we still have low pressure in charge, throwing through the fronts of rain, some showers coming through throughout today and the rest of the week. Some of them will be heavy and thundery. And this morning, we have got some snow lying on the ground, most of it wet and slushy across parts of Wales and the southwest of England, and most of it on 
grassy surfaces so not really on the road so not a massive travel problem but there's a lot of rain out there too across northern ireland particularly where there's a warning uh, in force for uh, much of today across uh, parts of the east and county down there has already been over 150 percent worth of the rainfall for the month so for scotland later we'll see rain arriving from the south and it will be a bit of a wet one a few wintry showers across the east over the high ground northern ireland dry for a time before further showers head up there and then sunshine and showers for england England and Wales this afternoon. Now, some of these showers are going to be heavy and thundery, and winds will also strengthen as well. So that's really going to make it feel quite cool, particularly along the south coast. There could be gusts up to 70 miles per hour. So very windy out there throughout today, especially the further south you are, and very wet at times with heavy and thundery showers. Those showers will be moving northwards tonight, up towards parts of the north of England, Northern Ireland, seeing yet more wet weather. So really uh, a big concern for eastern parts of Northern Ireland, where that rain warning is in force up until 3 a.m. And there will be rain getting confined to the north of Scotland overnight. So clear spells for central areas and somewhat drier and clearer for parts of the Midlands and Wales. But there will be yet more rain heading towards southern and eastern areas by the early hours of the morning and continuing cloudy and wet there throughout uh, tomorrow, becoming more showery in nature into the afternoon. In fact, for most places tomorrow, it's a case of sunshine and showers. Those showers are likely to be heavy and thundery once again with the risk of hail. Temperatures will be slightly higher compared to today with lighter winds, so it will feel slightly milder. But of course, if you get caught out in a shower, it's not going to feel that great. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Cheers, Naz. Now it's time to have another look through this today's papers with writer Emma Wolfe and journalist James Bloodworth. Welcome back both. We're going to start with a really tragic story, Emma, in The Telegraph. Yeah, this is this um, baby, Finley, that we've been um, hearing about over the past day, um, who died as a result, well, at the hands of his parents. Um, unimaginable cruelty. The judge called it unimaginable cruelty. These parents deliberately left his child to die. He was, he was found on Christmas... He died on Christmas Day 2020 in the middle of lockdown. Uh, he had 71 bruises, 57 fractures. He had multiple cigarette burns. He was living in absolute squalor. He was utterly failed not only by his parents, but murdered by his parents, but failed by the social services, basically, in lockdown. The parents used... Um, this is an excuse. You can see his parents there. They were sentenced last May to 27 and 29 years, respectively. Um, they were very heavy cannabis users. They were spending thousands and thousands on drugs. It seems that people were not allowed access to see him. All these meetings were happening on phones. You know, they weren't in-person meetings. Well, when you're talking about a 10-month-old baby living with parents like this, you need to be getting in there. And they used the lockdown, the, the, the parents used this sort of winter lockdown as an excuse. And there were family members who were very concerned. Yeah. There were carers who had looked after him and looked after him really well. Um, and, yeah, there we go. It's just uh, it's, absolutely appalling. Yeah, I mean, obviously. have we learned nothing I know, from, from Baby P, baby. from Victoria Columbia, from all these cases, and then do to impose know, lockdown? Have... There should be some areas do you know, do you know, that I, are exempt. I, I read this and I thought, we're going to have a debate about lockdown, we're going to have a debate yeah. about yeah. social services. I just want to make it about evil people. Mm. And I just want to make it about the got, baby. We, we've both got new babies, and yeah. I'm sorry, 27 years, yeah. I could get into a huge debate life. They shouldn't be allowed out, mate. That, I, that's beyond me. And, I, and, it, and it actually, genuinely, I, I'm sure for you as well as a mother even more, yeah. I just, I'm looking at that kid that breaks my heart. Do you know what somebody said to me the other day about kids? Imagine the lottery of birth. You could end up with those scumbags. You could end up with this lady or my wife. It's absolutely. I wouldn't let them out. I wouldn't let them... I can't even... It's, it's hard to... I have to say, I'll say the wrong thing and then, then I'll get a bit vile. Yeah, yeah and it's scum. hard to kind of, you know, verbalise how vulnerable a baby is at that age. They are, I mean, 10 months old. You'll go old. home to your kid and you'll look at your kid later. I know, and I go, know, but... I love you and I'd do anything for you till the end of this earth. It's beyond me. And it's unimaginable. Sadly, yeah. James, people <clears throat> like this do exist. We're, you know, just being realistic about it, we're not going to rid the world of parents like these two. So what can we do? And the answer is, like you said, social services but sometimes people slip through the cracks and it's mm. about making sure that something like this never happens again. But we're here again, aren't we? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's not just social services, like the family court as well. So, I mean, at one point, social services actually warned the family court that it, there needed to be a longer period um, of kind of transition before the parents were deemed fit to actually look after the baby. And that was rejected by the family court. Um, so it's a mixture, you know, you have had 
social services have, have, have messed up, but then you have had other, other parts of the machinery of social services actually sounding the alarms, which were then ignored by other parts of the system. So, I mean, the system has failed because, yeah, yeah you do get but evil why is there parents, a presumption? but the system has to but be in place. But why is there a presumption that, that he should be returned to his parents? That seems to be utterly wrong. Completely there is no question that this child was not being looked after yeah. by these people. <clears throat> give him a new start. Give him, leave him with his carers. Get, rehome him. Give him to the you foster know, family or let him be adopted. Uh, why return him? Mate, can why we, return him again other, and again? I'll tell you the other thing, and I have to be really careful because it got me thrown off a TV show once. Um, you know when you hear these stories about, oh, well, she's had this, they've had this baby and that one's going to be taken into care and she's pregnant again and that will definitely go into care. There is a thought, and I'm not allowed to use the word, that people like this oh, should Shouldn't be prevented be yeah. from having children. We all know what I'm... I'm not going to use that word. Yeah. I just... I, it's beyond me. That kid could have been born into anything. The system has failed it. It could have been adopted. Yeah. Oh, Sadly, oh. The, 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 bit, the, work, the hardest job in the world, which is being a parent and being a good parent to a baby like that, is the easiest thing to do. You know, you can just get pregnant like that and have a baby. And so there's no... As you say, we can't use that word. We can't talk about that kind of thing. I wish we could. But, but isn't it appalling how easily someone can be in charge of a fragile little being like that. Yeah. And people will say, the system, and I accept what you're saying, but these people spent money on cannabis rather than Thousands. caring from their kid. Thousands, okay? And yeah. that is fundamentally why they shouldn't have been but parents. But there weren't... So there was a proposition to, to drug test them, but then yeah. that was rejected. By I who? Mean, that's, that's, By who? Uh, um, I think that was the Some social, social the services system. in the family yeah. courts. Yeah, a part, again, a part of the bureaucracy, which would have been an obvious way to... Um, put another kind of safeguard so the kids sure. didn't go back to the parents. Also, if a child is covered in cuts and bruises and fractures yeah. and they cigarette burns, it's you about the baby. It's not about I, these drug adult idiots. Obviously, a, a parent's right to have access to their children is very important. However, in, in cases like this, the baby needs to be taken away yes. into somewhere that's safe and then... Um, systems need to be put in place to make sure that the parent can become a good and I would say, testing I would behavioural say five, courses, but no. I don't no. even care about... No, I would say five years later, if they want to come back and they show that they really are yeah. reformed and they're better and they're... But, but you cannot put a child back into this kind of situation. Forgive my ignorance, how did the baby pass away? Do we know? Have, have there been 57 details fractures, about 75 that? I mean, he was bruises, very, battered. very badly injured. OK, so, yeah. it's just absolutely awful. Right, we're going to move on to a different story now, but something that we have been covering this morning, James. Water giants in deep trouble. So you did <laughs> oh, that. Yeah, you could say another word there. Yeah. After sewage <laughs> spills have doubled in a year. Yeah, I mean, this is this has been getting really bad for, for three or four years now. Um, so, yeah, the number of spills, sewage spills, surged to, to just under half a million, up 54% um, compared to last year. Um, this is... Yeah, I mean, the water companies, at the same time, you've had a huge multi-million pound bonuses being paid to, share, to, to shareholders and also chief executives of the water company. So um, one of the five worst offenders, the, fir the, the chief exec of the firm of that received a four million payout last year. Um, another top offender, um, the chief exec there, received 1.6 million pounds in bonuses. Um, it's obviously not perf performance related because you see the state of our rivers. Yeah. I just think the, the whole privatisation of water has completely failed. It's a natural monopoly. There's no reason these... Parasitic companies should be taking money out of these 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 companies it's when an they can, they're not doing the job. And, and, and the guy said they're earlier who we job. had on Ash from from a local authority in Oxford, mm. and I think his words were excellent. He said, "Pollution for profit is disgusting." Just Bills are going up. Bills are going up. Yeah. Rivers are becoming more polluted, and then you see these people getting millions and millions of pounds. I, I'm, I, I'm it's a natural gonna, monopoly. There's no I'm need for a like private him. company. I completely to, to agree run with it. everything James is saying. Tell me about the fish that are high on cocaine. As well, this James. is this is. Uh, I, mean, I mentioned this earlier. It's incredible. Every single fish and marine animal has got cocaine in its system. Yeah, oh, I mean, well, this... now the vegetarians are laughing, aren't we? Oh god. <laughs> this is one of the bizarre kind of side effects of this. Oh, yeah. You're you not have... eating this junk. You have uh, also contraceptive pills and and general and just sewage. So you have you have fish swimming around in, yeah, cocaine, antidepressants, contraceptive pill. Um, effluent and also uh, human feces. It's, I have um, never ever understood why 
our sewage system is directly linked to our drinking water system. It doesn't make sense to I've me. never understood why people go to a posh restaurant and buy Evian or whatever the water is and then say, I'll have some ice, which is but, from but the But this, this problem, this problem did, did go away. <coughs> then yeah. the companies have taken them, have extracted the profit from the companies instead of reinvesting. Can I read a couple of and comments? So it's come back. I just think we should have a separate system that, yes. is, that doesn't cross over into drinking water or into rivers and A couple seas. of comments. Should water right. companies be stripped of profits over this pollution for profit? Uh, Michael, they should not be making profit over our water. Sue, they should be made to use their profits to upgrade the sewage system and uh -huh. the directors should be made accountable. And Lee says quickly, sorry, yes, definitely. I live in Langston Harbour in Hampshire and the water company is regularly discharging waste into the water. It is utterly disgusting. This is shared by everybody. This it is part. disgusting. And it's not just sewage and pollution, which I just find... Yeah, you almost don't want to think about yeah. what you're drinking, what you're touching, what you're what you're going to possibly go and potter in the sea in. But it's also the fact that, you know, you have these massive leaks throughout our London streets and uh, streets all over the UK. Then you have floods, then you have hosepipe bans. We just seem to the whole entire water system is there anything, in this country. Is, like, is there anything happy we can talk about today? I think so, because this is a, a I'm medical... I'm not trying to be miserable, <laughs> but I, honestly, I'm getting quite this depressed. This is an incredible development. I'm absolutely fascinated What's with this? dogs that are trained to be able to sniff out different conditions. We know that they can oh. smell diabetes in the some o. people, sometimes cancer. Um, but can now sniff cancer out. There are certain dogs who have been trained to be able to sniff uh, cancerous cells, yes. Uh, but now, James, dogs can sniff out post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, so this is kind of, it sounds, when I first read the story, it sounds kind of far-fetched, like, how is that possible? But, but animals can often detect stress. And yeah. one of the, the indicators of PTSD is, is high stress, which, which can be detected by dogs through smell. So, I mean, it, it, it does actually, when you think about it and look into it, it does make a lot of sense. Um, and this shows, you know, the role that, that dogs specifically can have in, in treating certain um, disorders. And PTSD is, is, is one of those. I think this is really... Uh, really encouraging. I think this is a really good story. You're, you're right there. They're probably just smelling something like cortisol, which is yeah, stress. Of but it's it, such a high level with PTSD. But PTSD, I know, but it's a term that we've imposed Sorry, on a level of stress. Dog, I think it's great, but but I don't really if a dog it. can sniff out PTSD, wouldn't the person or people around them at that point know that person's got that? What? Be well, this is a trial. Would you know if you had PTSD? I mean, I mean it's a serious comment that I'm um, making. Not Would, well, not necessarily. Would those around you that love you say, because of this traumatic event, to it's, me, you It depends help. if they know about this post-traumatic event. We know that people take years to often yeah. expose sexual abuse, stuff yeah. like that. It's not just people, you know, who've been in the army and have, have witnessed, you know, horrific explosions, Dave's right. They hide it, they put on a brave face, a dog can sniff it out. Yeah. Right, interesting, yeah. That's I'm not sure I want a dog smelling my breath. <laughs> I don't, don't smell a dog's breath. I don't want to get highly... that close to dogs, really. I, I, I don't slight, want to smell a dog's I'm breath. I'm slightly worried by a breed, do, that, um, the way I they say hello breath. to each other. That's was, the, do you exactly. know what I mean? Hello, exactly. Jessa, meet my wife. I mean, and the then... whole thing's not right, is it, to be no. honest? You know. um, fat people, all yours. How very dare you, Jeremy Kyle, Emma, this... No, because you'll do it better than me. I'll say the wrong thing. Well, you already have. I'll say the wrong thing. Being fat... <laughs> she will. Being fat really is in your genes. That's <laughs> genes with a J. Yeah, genes. Jeans. Well, OK, so according to The Sun, um, so they are this. saying that actually being fat is in our DNA. It's not about how much exercise you do. Some people are predisposed to be obese. And they're, they're now saying that actually this one-size-fits-all approach to obesity doesn't work. Yeah. That we can't just treat people as, oh, oh you know, you're obese. You've got to... It's about... The, they're saying that it's a number of steps that you do will really ward off obesity. So if you're predisposed to being obese, you've got to do over 11,000 a day, whereas, you know, more uh, skinnier people can do um, over around 8,000. I mean, I, I just... I just don't buy it. Really? I just don't buy it. No, do I'm afraid... it's a mixture of the two, though? No, because I have travelled to places, um, sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where you see, and I know this is a... Everybody says it, but it is true, where there is not enough food and where people are working very, very physically hard and you do not see obesity. Obesity, I'm not blaming people, I'm not saying it's just about eating, but we live in an obesogenic society. Everything mitigates towards lack of activity and more consumption. So I don't think, I, perhaps, perhaps some people hold weight more, put it on more easily. Yeah. But mostly I do believe it's down to what you eat and how much you move. Some people are really, I mean, I'm very hyperactive. I'm always moving. That wouldn't be listed as like exercise, but you, it's kind of part of your DNA. But James, couldn't somebody be genetically predisposed to being more active? Uh, I don't know about predisposed different. to be more active. You can definitely be ge genetically predisposed to putting on fat easier, also yes. putting on muscle easier. So some people, I've had friends who will go to the gym, do like a, go once a week 
and then just eat McDonald's and then be ripped. And it's yeah. like, well, that's genetics, isn't it? And it's, but again, it's, Emma's right in that you don't want it to become fatalistic. Like, you can offset all of this through doing exercise. It's not like, oh, there's no point doing exercise because I'm going to be overweight. I mean, you can offset it through a healthy I, lifestyle. I, I, God, I find myself sitting there every it's day. It's harder for some to... people than others. You know, oh, she were born big bone. No, she wasn't. There's got to be something in the truth that if you eat more, whether you're predisposed to eat more or you have problems, I accept all of that, but if you eat more, you will put on weight if you don't exercise. If you don't eat enough, right, but you will lose weight. You can't deny that you will see families or perhaps even know families who but are a bit larger just, and it... And that's cultural because in their family... Thank you. ...they're doing they less exercise and eating more. All the time. And there are so many other reasons for that. Be, I'm not blaming why them. Why do we advocate but healthy eating and exercise? if you just fed the same people exactly the same diet and they both did exactly the same thing, Big bones, I'm afraid. There is would be a variance in, in the weight, though. It, you but can it have people be... eat the same meals, do the same exercise, and some people will right. just put so, on weight. So, easier. so Oliver, easier. right, you can tell straight away he's going to be like my dad and he's going to be over six foot. Mm -hmm. Henry is never going to be more than five and a half foot. So you could say, will he be skinnier because he's taller? And more? I don't know about that, but I do know that it is about de diet and exercise yeah. and, and stuff like that. It's very interesting, though. Very it's interesting, it's indeed. indeed. Well, thank you so much to Emma and James. They'll be back with more papers in just under mm. an hour. And here's a man who exercises and does not eat McDonald's and is utterly ripped, and that is why she sat up straight, pulled her jacket together, <laughs> and has gone a slight little shade of red, Corporal <laughs> Of course, because Your boys here. Sam Ellard has got all the latest with your sports. Good morning, guys. All oh, that's not true. I love the McDonald's, by the way. But Chelsea <laughs> ladies, know. they put their place <laughs> in the Women's Champions League semi-finals. A second successive season running. A comfortable victory over Ajax elsewhere. The former Spanish FA boss, Luis Rubiales, could face over two years in prison after he grabbed Jenny Hermoso and kissed her on the mouth after Spain's World Cup victory. And if you're thinking of going to Germany for the Euros this summer, be very careful. The Foreign Office are warning you about the strengths of the pints. This is Talk Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 7.47. Now, Chelsea booked their place in the Women's Champions League semi-finals for a second season running with a comfortable aggregate victory over... Now, is it Ajax or Ajax? Neither. I think you got them both wrong. What, how do you pronounce it? Ajax. Oh, goodness me. You, you went Ajax. What was the second one you went for? Look, no, I no. can't... Ajax, thank you very much. Well, here with the latest is Talk Sports, Sam Ellard, who I, sh I should have introduced earlier, sorry. You've Sam. embarrassed no, okay. your girlfriend now. Okay. Why don't you two have a tip and I'll just sit here? Ajax. Ajax. So why yeah. doesn't okay. somebody do that grenade? What's the word? Hey, if you Phonetically. Don't... If That's you it. don't ask, you'll never find out. Tell me about Ajax. Um, a good win for, uh, for Chelsea. This is, of course, Emma Hayes' final few months in charge of Chelsea before she... Is it Chelsea she moved... or Chelsea? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But that's definitely <laughs> che Chelsea. You know that one, don't you, Nicola? Yes, yeah, I know that one. I thought you were getting better at the sport as well. Hey, yeah. I'm learning, I'm learning. No, you're doing, doing good, you right. Um, good win for Chelsea last night. They're into the semi-finals now of the Women's Champions League. Uh, they were 3-0 up from the first leg. So it was sort of just a, a procession yesterday. 1-1 draw on the nights. They went through 4-1 on aggregate. So they're into semi-finals. They could face Barcelona, who knocked them out of the semi-finals at the same stage Last season, um, Emma Hayes has been at Chelsea for over 10 years. She's won 15 major leaving. trophies there. Leaving, going to America. She's an absolute legend in this country. Is it but high yes? High yeah, definitely. I, th I think it's Hayes. Okay. Right. I think it's definitely Hayes. You, you're never going to live this down now, are you, nope. Nicola? But the one trophy she hasn't won at Chelsea is the Champions League. So it would be okay. fitting, I think, on her way out if she was to lift the Champions League in the semi-finals. She, he's in a really weird mood. Is it so I can't no, do this. or is it's it just... no P? Oh, my goodness. You can just get out. <laughs> You she, carry on, Why don't you go get and make a coffee, Jeremy? If we'll, 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 I might go do then. my lines you the can, you can, Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right, should we move on to another I story? think this is really interesting to get your take on this because I'm really strong, but it's over to you. This is yes. Luis Rubiales. OK, so, so here's where we stand. Luis Rubiales, as we know by now, or should know by now, was the former um, head of the Football Federation of, of, of Spain. He ran Spain um, after Spain won the World Cup. That picture there, that image is, is something that has been a massive story in, in sport, the kiss on Jenny Hermoso, which, of course, caused a lot of controversy. He lost his job, which I think we'd all probably say rightly so, after that incident. But we now take this further because Luis Rubiales is facing charges of sexual assault and coercion after he grabbed Hermoso and kissed her on the mouth. And the charges, guys, they carry prison terms of one year and 18 months, respectively. I'll move this over to you, Nicola. I know you want to have your say. He's yeah. lost his job, but should this go even further? And should he spend time in prison? I absolutely think that he should be punished and prosecuted sort of criminally for something like this, particularly considering how he lacks remorse after. I don't think that a two and a half year jail term is right, mainly because I think there will be, as I'm sure there has been this morning, a huge backlash. And what people will end up doing is blaming the woman for the fact that this man's been punished. Well, I'm sorry, she's reported it. It happened to her. She's got actually got nothing to do with this. She has nothing to do with this story because she just happened to be the woman at the centre of it. Whereas he chose to do it and it's the system that should perhaps be criticised rather than the woman. I worry that a jail term like this will mean that she ends up being criticised more than she deserves, which is she deserves no criticism at all. Yeah, because it's of course important here, isn't it, that she's not, she's not, she's, she's the victim in this. She's it the victim. Be, it shouldn't be put on and her. And I just think two and a half years for something like this, we talk about rape, uh, I mean, obviously it's in Spain, yeah. but like the sentence for rape, et cetera, eight years, it just, it feels like an overcompensation. Yeah, sure. Whereas actually what should have happened is he should have immediately lost his job. He shouldn't have led to being, res to resigning. Yeah. It's on the FA to deal with this rather than necessarily prosecutors. But I, I do think it's right that he, you know, is, is, Prosecuted so criminally. Years, Same question you know, to you, Jeremy. Yeah, I do. I agree with Nick. What I think is in danger is it, it undermines. I mean, it, yeah. we live in a world where you can seemingly get away with an awful lot. I'm not defending the guy at all. I think you're right about her. Um, 
two and a half years in jail for Kirsten Sorry. I think we're, we're getting You'll get to people a protesting about it, and this is what's awful. It's like, no, please listen to women, listen to victims when something happens to them. There were calls for him to be sacked. That didn't happen, right? He ended is that up not resigned. Enough? He, he, was he not resigned. Enough? He wasn't sacked. Yeah. He resigned. Mm. So there are people calling for that, and so they've overcompensated Probably, yeah. now by going two and a half years in jail. And I bet a lot of people, a lot of campaigners are going, well, no, that's not what we asked for, actually. Yeah. He needed to be held accountable. I don't see what two and a half years in jail is going to do so to hold you him think, accountable. You think, you think the, the biggest issue here was kind of the first couple of months and how they yes. dealt yeah, with yeah, it? Yeah. The fact that they weren't um, firm on it. They didn't get rid of him originally. Yeah. I, I mean, he's fair. a that's busted fair. flush. <laughs> We're back to the sewage. Um, can I do this? Go on. I, um, Brits warned about German pints. Why have I said that? Ahead of the Euros 2021. Who's advising us here? What's, what's this all about? This is, this is quite extraordinary. Um, Brits travelling to Germany this summer have been what warned. What happened there? I, I don't haven't know. done anything. Oh, look. Oh, this is brilliant. Crack up. No, 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 I'm going to do it now. Look. Are we the still live? Are we live on the bits? Still no, the chair is falling to bits. <laughs> there we go. Bits. Is that. Is that... <laughs> OK, you dealt with it in a real professional manner, though, didn't you, Jeremy? Nothing happened. Can we talk now. about pints and yes, England fans sure. in Germany? Yeah, because, yeah, Brits travelling to Germany this summer uh, have been warned the beer can be stronger in Germany than what they drink at home. Nanny state. Do we need to be Ad warned? Advice issued, by the way, by the Foreign Office, include strength of German beer and fans who, uh, who are drunk in the stadium, risk being removed and barred. We've even got some numbers here, guys. How yep. about this? Um, lager and ale in the UK average 4.4% alcohol by volume, whereas German beer averages 4.7% to 5.4%. So it's a little bit more... Listen, it's not a lot more. Can you can you imagine though, like an England fan sat listening to this right I'll now? I'll tell you what, I'm not having a pint because it's four point yeah, seven. Yeah, imagine like planning on going over there, being like, hmm. Have you yet, yeah, Phil? Have you have you seen the? Have you have checked you the see, foreign office's uh, we, travel guide? Yeah, have you seen the, the percentage? Thing. And that's the other thing, isn't it? Without wanting to decry, obviously people go yes, but people become alcoholics. What about free choice? I'm sure the Foreign Office has got slightly better, better things, things to, to do, do in the world that we've got with what's happening in the Middle East and what's happening in I, Ukraine, for God's sake, rather than warning yeah. football fans, well, 4.7%. Jeez, man. I didn't want to say that, but it feels like they've got bigger things to deal with they right really now. Well, do. England fans having a few pints over in Germany. Look, the England fans and let know me tell you, travel well. It's pretty boring in Germany anyway. I think the only thing to do is to drink, isn't well, it? How and, dare you? and also you could argue as well with the football that Gareth Southgate's England play these days. I mean, you know, a couple of points for a couple of points before the game of football. Are you criticizing is needed. Gareth Southgate? Yeah, as a, as a, as a, do you like the way I brought the alcohol I've got in? something for you. From Who's gonna be the next England manager? Here's here's another little bet that Nick will go down to the bookies later on and put some money in. I've got a little theory well, about the next She can't spell his name, so she struggled to find him on the, on the list. I'm not she, encouraging you know, betting no, before people say that. No, Jose do that. Mourinho to be the next England manager. Oh, that would Definitely. be... Definitely. It, it, it would be brilliant, it would man. Be, it, they should make... If Jose Mourinho becomes England manager, they should put it on Netflix. It, it, it would be incredible. But I am the special one. It's 2024, it's, isn't it? I'm not sure Jose Mourinho is the way forward for England. And absolutely. He's, I'm not sure, Jeremy. I don't know. Why are you saying I think, Jeremy like that? No, not... this is a serious conversation. I'm not sure Jose, Jose moving forward is. Don't is you the mean right Jose Morahainio? Jose Morahainio, yeah. that's right. Thank yeah. you very much. Nicola, yes. where we are we going to do a bit Mickey? No, we want to do Mickey's cannabis sweets. Oh my goodness, great. This, <laughs> by the way, can we, this has been the most random <laughs> all over the place sports We're update finishing with cannabis. Ever. We're going to, we can do cannabis on this show, right? That's, that's what Only at the end of an hour. Only at the end of an hour, sure. Okay, at the top about uh, the rivers, cannabis at the end. How about this? Mike Tyson, legendary boxer is selling a range of cannabis sweets. OK, but how about this? It's shaped, genuinely, it's shaped. Have a look at that. Like Evander Holyfield's ear, of course, famously, he when he bit his ear off during a boxing title fight back in 1997, he took a chunk out of his ear and that very ear, well, not the exact ear, is being turned into a cannabis sweet and Mike Tyson is genuinely selling them. I don't really know what to ask you guys. I'm not really sure where it's to. It's a bit. Where seems to take mad. This next. Uh, surely, yes. surely Holyfield should get a bit of a cut of the profits of this. You think so, wouldn't you? Yes. It's hit by the ear, right? I it is it funny. Go 50 -50, it is funny, they? though, isn't it? I mean, it does sum up how messed up the world is. Yes, it is quite funny. Uh, cat... They've been Mike... marketed as Mike bites. Mike bites. Yes, <laughs> they're, 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 they're being called Mike bite. I mean, look, Mikey, Mikey, bite this. Oh my God, he's, he's like a dog with a bone. Thank would you reckon really? that? I don't think you should yeah, say they that. Yeah, they look they look quite they're, tasty. They look quite tasty. There thank, we go. Thank you so we much. We know we're doing a half nine today, don't we? Exactly. Cheers, Sam. Eight o'clock in the yeah. break. Yeah. Thank you so much. Lots Thanks, more mate. still to come on Talk today. Now, as the Labour leader prepares to launch his local election campaign, we will be asking why he's decided to give credit to one of Boris Johnson's flagship policies. This is Talk Today. It is 7.56. Good morning.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you, my friends. It's gone 8 o'clock on Thursday, the 28th of March. Here we talk today on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Here are your top stories this morning. Check this out. Starmer praises Boris. The head of Labour's local election campaign launched today. Sakia says that Johnson had the right idea on levelling up, but then blames uh, current Pierre Richard Sunak for killing the policy. We will speak to Labour frontbencher Lisa Nandy this hour on the show. What a mess. Sewage pours into England's rivers and seas. More than 3.6 million hours of spills were recorded. That's double from the previous year. Well, our correspondent will be live from a dirty waterway in Oxford. And prison problems at times. Investigation unearths a culture of violence and infestations of rats and cockroaches at one of Britain's most dangerous jails. We'll speak to a former prisoner governor before the end of the show. And rain is the name of the game once again for today, oh. as well as strong winds and snow for some. I'll have all the details in the forecast a little later. Cheers, Naz. Now it's time for the headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. Official figures have confirmed that the UK economy fell into recession last year with the worst annual growth since 2009. Gross domestic product, which is a measure of how much we all made, shrunk by 0.3% between October and December. 
Two bodies trapped in a pickup truck have been recovered from the river in Baltimore, where a bridge was hit by a cargo ship on Tuesday. Rescuers have been looking for six construction workers who were repairing it when it collapsed. But divers are no longer able to safely search the waters because of concrete and debris. Thames Waters shareholders are refusing to give the company £500 million of promised cash unless bills rise. The firm, which supplies around a quarter of the UK, is facing growing financial problems as high interest rates add to the cost of its £18.3 billion debts. Rishi Sunak has admitted he struggles to be a good father alongside the demands of being Prime Minister. He's featuring on The Times' new podcast, The Story, and described being away from his family as the toughest part of the job. I've got two young girls uh, who mean the world to me, and mm -hmm. obviously doing these jobs, it's, yeah. it's hard to balance being a good dad and, and doing the job well. And obviously you, you have to prioritise this job because it's an important job and you're doing it on behalf of the whole country. So you know, not being there for them as much as any dad would like to be is, is yeah. a challenge and there's particular moments where that you really feel that acutely because there's something very difficult going on that you just can't be them be there for them at, yeah. and that, that's tough and the goggle box star george gilby has died after falling from a height at work the 40 year old appeared in eight series of the show as well as celebrity big brother channel four said their thoughts are with his family and friends you're up to date i'll have more headlines in an hour Thanks, Em. Uh, really appreciate it. A couple of minutes past eight. Loads to discuss today. We'd love uh, your thoughts, please. One of the things that's really got you is uh, we talked about um, water companies. Um, did you hear in the news there? I did indeed. Shareholders uh, will, not, will not give any money back, raise bills. This is the whole point. There's sewage being poured into rivers, into lakes, into seas. Forget the environmental thing for just a second. And these fat cat bosses of water companies are giving themselves like four million pound profits and bonuses. Our bills are going up and our economy, not our economy, our environment is being screwed. We said, should water companies be stripped to profits over the sewage crisis? I think so. Well, Grace got in touch to say that water companies claim to raise the bill in order to help stop sewage leaks. They've been saying this down here in the West Country for years. In the end, what have we got? Dirty rivers, polluted beaches and the highest water charges. Monitor Samuel, these water companies should totally be stripped of their profits for sewage and other leaks. The road near my home has had water leaking from the same spot despite being opened up three times for repairs. Incredible. Daisy says, occasionally it makes me wonder, what are we paying for? Just for their profits or for more money to line their fat cat's pockets whilst we struggle with their skyrocketing bills and drink their recycled sewage water. Uh, Joshua says, I think we should nash uh, re-nationalise the water because these water companies don't care about our environment. It's all about profit and huge dividends for shareholders. What do you think? Hey, hey. Talk today at talk.tv. Text to 8722. Five past eight, Corporal Thought. Let's crack on. Well, to our top story now. Sir Keir Starmer has praised Boris Johnson for his efforts to level up Britain. The Labour leader said that the former PM had the right idea and accused Rishi Sunak of killing the policy. Sakir is launching his party's local election campaign today where he, he pledges to tackle, I don't know what this means, alienation and powerlessness across much of the country. So let's cross to Talk TV correspondent, the brilliant Olivia... Uh, Olivia? Olivier. Olivia uh, whitfield Mitchic, who is at that Labour launch in the West Midlands. Good morning, Oliver. What are we expecting from Starmer today? Throw us something here, man. Come on. And <laughs> Good morning, Jeremy. Not just from the Labour leader, Sakia Starmer, but also from the deputy leader, Angela Rayner. We're expecting them to really fire the starting pistol of the local election campaign, which will happen on May the 2nd. It will see constituents from 107 local authorities go and pack, cast their ballots and decide who will be their councillors to take on very important things in their local authority area, such as how to fix potholes and to make sure that the schools are in running order. All of that will happen in just over a month's time. Now, we're expecting that speech here this morning in the West Midlands by both Starmer and Ray, Rayner, they are also going to have a bit of a spring in their step as they head into this campaign because consistently the polls have shown that they've got 20 points ahead of the Conservatives and so we're expecting the duo to try to capitalise on that and to try to make that gap even bigger. We've already seen that in the Times opinion piece which was written by the Labour leader and his deputy today, rather surprisingly praising Boris Johnson's levelling up agenda. But at the same time, trying to 
divide the party supporters between Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak by saying that the current Prime Minister killed off levelling up. Instead, they say that they're going to give more powers to local authorities and to local leaders because they'll be able to decide on the things that really matter to their local areas in a bill that they say is going to be called the Taking Back Control Act. Another thing, another soundbite that we've heard in previous Conservative administrations, taking back control of our monies, laws and borders. Remember that from when Theresa May was in power. It's not just going to be Labour that's holding events like this in the days and weeks ahead. You can expect the same from the Conservatives, from the Reform Party, who are also eating away at that blue vote. The likes of Plaid Cymru in Wales, as well as from the Lib Dems and from the smaller Green Party. The key dates that we've got to look forward to as we head in to the election campaign... April the 16th is the deadline if you want to register to vote in person. The next day on the 17th of April is the deadline if you want to register to vote by post. And on the 18th of April is the deadline to register if you want to cast a proxy vote where somebody else will cast your ballot. In total, there will be 2,000 seats up for grabs at this local election in what will be a tightly watched race because although the outcome of the uh, local elections doesn't really play any part in central government, it will be a key indicator potentially of who will form the next government whenever the general election is called, most likely looking now to be in October. Well, thank you so Thanks, much, mate. Oliver whitfield Mirchich in the West Midlands there. Well, we're joined in the studio now by former Home Office Minister Norman Baker. Norman, good morning. Before good morning, we do anything, you. you failed me, haven't you? Have I? Where's your red box you promised to bring in? I didn't promise to bring it in. I mentioned it was difficult to bring it on public transport. Oh, yes, it might. I want to see his red box. Well, <laughs> and enough of that for later. Norman, um, what do you make... What do you think, sorry, will be announced later on in Labour's local election campaign? Oh, lots of warm words, uh, promises to devolve more power, uh, support for local areas. It wouldn't mean very much unless there's money attached to it because the reality is that 2015 local councils have been on the floor and they've got no cash. Look at the state of the potholes. When I was in France and Germany, by the way, there was no potholes anywhere over there in the last month or so. Potholes everywhere. Um, youth centres closing by the day, libraries being shut... Unless there's going to be more money from Labour or a recast of how local council taxes are formed, it won't make a slight, slight bit of difference. I'm quite interested in these local elections for, for one, well, two reasons, actually. One is <clears throat> whether it's a barometer to how hacked off people really are with politics in general. Yeah. Also, there's that whole big argument, which I fervently believe in, you might not, Nick might not, that, that actually we're, we're stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea with local councils. Either you give them complete autonomy and power and the, the central government is not going to bail you out if you get it wrong. There are many councils, Labour and Tory, I should make this point, who are skinned across the country to yes. complete man, bad man man management or it, it, it it's it's rode back upon my, my question about where they are today and what they're saying is i can't get over the fact that 10 days ago we had potentially the first ever female chancellor in this country saying thatcher today we've got keir starmer in that red wall area quoting boris johnson i mean you look back four years I mean, talk about change, Norm. It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And what the Labour Party is doing, or at least what Keir Starmer is trying to do, uh, is to present himself as, a, as an acceptable Conservative. That's what he's doing. He's trying to say that this lot are out of control, but we'll carry on with our policies, but deliver them more effectively. That's essentially the message Is there giving. a danger trying to be all things to all people? Of course there is. And actually, the danger is, if they are going to just carry on with that very much change and inherit the Conservative spending plans, then what's actually going to be the difference between this lot and the next lot? If, however, they're going to have a radical policy they haven't told about, then that's dishonest because it won't be in the manifesto. So they've got to actually come clean on what they want to do. Mm. Are they going to focus... I'm kind of obsessed with this idea. Are they going to focus on big national issues, even though it's a local election campaign? Or is it wiser to go in with saying, mm. we're going to collect your bins on time, <clears throat> we're going to fill in those hot potholes? Are they going to be much smaller localised campaign promises? I think they're going to talk about devolution from the centre and right. how local authorities need to be reinvigorated and all that sort of vague language, which I agree with, but unless it's underpinned by money... 
It won't mean anything. That's the basic. That's the bottom line. Local councils, they're not. Yes, Jeremy, there are some which have been mismanaged, yeah. like Birmingham. Yeah. But there are other ones which have been not mismanaged, which are on the on no, the no. bread line too. Listen, I completely agree. Um, <clears throat> my my point, and I really want to pick you up on it because I think you're absolutely right. And this is in no way me criticising anybody. There ain't no money left. Right? No. It, we are, whether it's the pandemic, mismanagement, our social services, well, our social uh, things in society are struggling. Our military is not at all what it should be. We have the immigration issue. We've got what's happening in the Middle East. We're happening in Ukraine. We're supposed to give money here, there, and everywhere. Well, I don't hear from Labour. I heard non dom for six months. That was three billion. Mm. Where We've heard about the rollback on the green thing for 20... Where's the money coming from, Norman? Because the reality is, once you get there, Starmer... It's a very different ball game. Where's the money coming from, Labour, for all these promises? Yes, well, we don't know the answer to that yeah. because um, I think they're going to pledge themselves to continue Tory spending pounds as Blair did in 97. Uh, but of course, in 97. To get it, elected. Yeah, and then it, the cracks begin to show. Well, the economy was much stronger in 97, yeah. so Blair and Brown inherited quite a good position. Um, Starmer and Rayner will not inherit that. Do you think that they can come up, or rather, different question, do you think they will come up between now and the election with. With, with solid looking policies, or do you think their whole game plan is there is such chaos we can just walk along and take it easy and walk into Downing Street? And at that point, the British mm. public will realise the reality of. of, of well, this they, new they may well do. I mean, look what's been happening in the last six months as they've rolled back from every single policy near enough they've had the 28 billion for uh, the Green Deal and so on, the bankers' bonuses. They've all gone. There's not much left very much. Uh, what they are talking about is pretty minuscule. You talked about water a moment ago, and uh, one of your uh, viewers, Joshua, was saying, let's renationalise the water industry. That's actually quite a popular policy. Uh, uh, it's, the water industry is out of control. Uh, why don't they say that? Because they're too, they're too fit, to use a Scottish word, they're too scared to do that. But do um, you not think... That, sorry, Nick, do you not think the British public, right, are... I'm more aware. Dave, can you turn your thing off? You're talking in my ear. Sorry, people at home. Still mad in. Do yeah. you? Is this a, a Labour Party that you recognise? It's certainly not the yeah, Labour Party. No, that I, was I don't power. recognise it. It's not. Certainly, it's a long way from from Corbyn, obviously. Sure. But it's a long way from Blair, actually, because Blair and Brown in '96, before the '97 election, had a lot of good ideas. They talked about. Um, uh, you know, minimum wage and so on. They were quite radical ideas. And they put those before the British public and they were elected on those ideas. There was a positive agenda. I don't see a positive agenda from Starmer. I see lots of warm words and nothing much underneath them. And I think, I think that's the really interesting thing. I think it's a done deal. I think it smacks of huge incompetence on the Tory front, which is what I've been really honest yes. to you about, and said they really messed up the most ridiculously brilliant position through complete incompetence and chaos. I still don't know what Keir Starmer's going to bring. And I do say to people, and I understand people will vote and that's fine, you might be quite surprised in two years' time um, about how it isn't all picture-perfect and it hasn't all been paid for and we're all absolutely... Because it's not like that. No, they're going to come into power. I think they will win the election. The only other possibility is a hung parliament, but the Tories are going to lose the election. That's very clear. And when they get in there, uh, they'll suddenly turn around and say, as uh, they did in 2010, actually, the other way around, oh, there's no money left. Uh, and the, the books are much worse than we thought. We can't do very much. And the Labour backbenchers who are elected will say, well, hang on, we're not going to stand here and do nothing and have Tory policies. We want to do something else. So he's actually building up a problem with his own party, I think, in terms of the loyalty of his own backbenchers, who are being very quiet at the moment. But I know from talk talking to them, you know, they've got their own agenda, which is about far more radical policies than Keir Starmer was talking about. I think about. that's a really, really good point, Norman, I do. I think the difference between now... And 18 months down the line is going to be, well, we talk quite rightly about everybody yeah. attacking Sunak. You wait till the left wing side of the Labour Party. He's painting himself statesman like, yeah. Yeah. almost Tory esque. They're not going to sit there for five years and keep No, going. they're not, no. And the bigger the majority there is, uh, the more difficulty he will have because they think, well, we can vote against this because the Labour Party will win the vote anyway. Fascinating. Thanks, well, thank you so much to former Home Office Minister Norman Baker for joining us in the studio. Let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages again now. It is our top story today. In The Times, Sir Keir Starmer takes inspiration from Boris Johnson's 2019 pledge to level up as the Labour leader launches his party's local election campaign later today. Uh, the Mail braces us for a summer election as the paper reveals that Rishi Sunak is under mounting pressure from his aides. What sort of pressure? Well, we'll of we will find out. And a thank you from the King. The Telegraph leads on the monarch's Easter message, focusing 
on extending the hand of friendship. Now, another big story in today's papers last year, and we did this a couple of hours ago, and it got such response, really important. Last year, a record-breaking amount of sewage spilt into our waters, ladies and gentlemen. 3.6 million hours, hours of raw sewage were pumped into our rivers, into our lakes, and into the sea, and that was double double the year before. So that works out as an average of 100 and sorry 1,271 spills a day right. across England. Unbelievable. Well, earlier today we spoke to water campaigner Ash Smith, who says that the Environment Agency has identified an illegal practice whereby the companies are not treating their sewage enough before dumping it. Here's what he told us. Well, they're only supposed to dump untreated sewage in exceptional circumstances. The permitting of the Environment Agency has, has distorted that slightly so that they generally have to spill after they've treated about three times the normal dry flow that they would, they would get in. We know that companies frequently cut that short. They, they do something called flow clipping, which is not treating enough um, before they dump it. And they also spill it in dry conditions. And that's because their systems are leaky. They get groundwater into their pipes and they spill for groundwater infiltration, which is actually an illegal aspect identified by the Environment Agency. Only one thing to do, send our intrepid talk today, correspondent Nicholas Ellaby, uh, who's from, well, he's in Oxfordshire right now. And, and this, is, this really has resonated this morning, Nick, with our viewers and our listeners. It's a disgrace. What are the people in the area you're in today? What, what are they concerned about? What are they saying? Yeah, morning, Jeremy. Morning, Nicola. You're right. This story resonates with everyone. Another story, just like potholes, that everybody is really, really keen to talk about. People are up in arms here in Oxfordshire. You know, we're looking at a local picture around Oxford, but actually the story is the same nationwide. Britain's waterways are becoming polluted. And as you were saying, those headline figures, it's getting worse, twice as worse. Last year, 3.6 million hours of sewage pumped into Britain's waterways. And actually, if you look at maps, this is just around Oxford. This is the Thames water around Oxford. These red dots you can see on this real-time alert are actually sewage being pumped out right now. Uh, and this is just in the area around the city of Oxford. So, you know, you can feel what it's like nationally. There's one place near here. It's been constant pumping of sewage into a stream uh, for the last three weeks. So, you know, it's a shocking picture we're finding. And it's putting off people from going into the water. Lots of wild swimmers around here in Oxfordshire. Uh, we've been speaking to some of them and people who, who walk along the, the waterways here. And here's what they've told us about how they're feeling about this problem. I've got a greyhound over there and we used to have two and uh, a few weeks ago he, he, he died and um, he stopped eating just, just before Christmas and within three weeks he was dead. Um, and he was a great, great drinker of um, flood water and river water and uh, the vets, it was, it was not conclusive I have to say, but they, 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 they said they couldn't rule out his liver was attacked and it was, it was quite scary. And I just tend to not try to put my head under the water or if it's really like a warm sunny day I would do it but keep my mouth closed I guess. Uh, and when I tell others that I am swimming here, uh, they're like, are you really? I uh, come here four or five times a week, and Fred the dog, he obviously likes to have a splash around in the river, but I've noticed recently, more so than ever, that when he does go in, he seems to have upset stomach that night, through the night, and to the next morning. So I tend to keep him on the lead and prevent him from going in the water when it's in flood. So you, you can see the depth of the problem. And also further down, these all feed into the Thames. Further down the Thames, organisers of the boat race this weekend have been told not to jump in, even in London, because of concerns about E. coli. And we've had those people telling us they don't let their dogs in anymore. We've got William Maxwell here, wild swimmer. Just tell us about the depth of this problem here, William. Well, I've been river swimming my whole life. And recently, particularly when there was a kind of renaissance in getting out of doors after COVID, you notice the quality of the water continues to deteriorate. Now, it's been known that there's been challenges around the release of sewage for many years. And it is utterly depressing that the companies responsible are making money while our rivers are getting worse year on year. Month by month, it seems. Now, I want to enjoy coming out to the rivers that are ours in this country, yet I feel that I'm having to step into something that's dirty, 
you know, that, that's unhealthy for us. You know, that's a huge problem. It's not just a problem for, for me. It's a problem for the, the increasing number of people who want to enjoy nature, enjoy the joys of getting yourself right, where, having a swim, being out in nature, you know, and we're, we're losing that. We're losing that in this country, and that's a shame. William, thank you so much. I mean, you can feel the passion there. This is impacting on the nation's mental health. Uh, I've got Councillor Chris Jarvis of the Greens here in Oxford. What do you want done about this, Chris? Well, frankly, it's a disgrace what we've seen with Thames Water. As you said at the start, they've more than doubled the number of hours they've been pumping sewage into our rivers. And frankly, we've seen for 35 years that the privatised water companies won't and can't take action to clean up our rivers. So clearly, the only solution we have is to take our water back into public ownership where it belongs. England and Wales are the only two countries in the entire world that has their water wholly in private ownership. It's time to bring it back into public hands. OK, Chris, thank you so much. Again, so we've got nationalising water. It seems to be a popular policy. Lots of angry wild swimmers. Guys, just in a noise or a word, how are you feeling about this situation? Well, cross. <laughs> Clean it up. Clean it well, up. Really angry. And one of the things that makes me most angry is that Thames Water had that money, but instead of spending it on upgrading the sewage infrastructure, it was pumping it out to its shareholders. Okay. okay, thank you so much. So, it's huge strength of feeling. Thames Water do say they are taking action to improve the health of the rivers, and they have published plans to upgrade over 250 sites. But, you know, that's just on paper at the moment. The government are doing their best as well. But the strength of feeling here in Oxford and around the country, huge. This needs sorting out, guys. Absolutely, Nick, thank Absolutely. you. Thank you so much, Nick Ellaby in Oxfordshire there. Did you hear what he said? Sorry, you know what things are said and then you go, in the boat race mm -hmm. this weekend, mm -hmm. the crews have been told, don't go in the water. You don't remember that one? They're sinking, they're sinking because of E. coli. You yep. saw people there really passionate. This is an utter, utter disgrace. Absolute disgrace. I'm all for renationalising the water industry, that is for sure. Well, still to come on Talk Today, the Archbishop of Canterbury voices his support for imprisoned journalist Evan Gershevik. Good. And comedian Ed Gamble is forced to swap a hot dog for a cucumber on his tour poster after being accused of promoting obesity. Oh, yeah, because that's what you want when you're hungry. I'll have a cucumber, not a burger. Right, to remember, Wolf and journalist James Bloodworth have a final look through this morning's papers. That's next. Stay with us. We're coming right back. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
the UK, I'd say, had lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 8.26. We'll have the weather in just a moment. But here is what else is coming up in the programme. Can you exercise your way to a good night's sleep? What? Experts say hitting the gym can curb insomnia. Ooh. That's because you'll be knackered. Yeah, we'll discuss that in the papers next. It's not rocket science, is it? <laughs> well, before 9 o'clock, we will be looking at a shocking undercover investigation from inside Britain's prisons, which unearthed filthy conditions and a culture of violence. And my favourite part of the morning, are seagulls taking over. The people of Liverpool say that the city has become overrun with what are being described as XL gullies. <clears throat> we'll discuss Gullies. That. Gullies. XL gullies. We'll Hello, mate. That. Calm down. Gullies are coming. Uh, disco what was that all about? We'll discuss that at 9.15. Calm down. Well, first, <laughs> Naz face. is here with the weather. Naz, what's it going to look Calm down. Please. <laughs> Is the weather going to be calming down, um, unlike Jeremy Kyle? <laughs> well, actually, uh, with the strong winds, there's probably lots of seagulls flying about, isn't there? Strong winds are blowing them away. Calm down. We'll crack on. He is the albatross around my neck. Please, Naz, <laughs> She is the duck on my stinky river. <laughs> oh, goodness, you two are quackers. Let's have a... Oh! <laughs> Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. Rain is the name of the game for today, for the rest of the week, in fact. Although it does become a tiny bit drier into the Easter weekend and a little bit calmer and slightly milder, but it won't be completely dry. There will be wet weather because low pressure continues to dominate the scene. It's thrown through lots of fronts with spells of rain, heavy, thundery showers and very strong winds over the next 24 hours as well. But the winds will ease as we head into the weekend. So let's take a look at the here and now. And there's been some wet snow around across parts of Wales and the southwest of England, mostly across grass surfaces so roads are mostly looking fine and we've also got to wet weather spreading to the southwest with wind strengthening there as well as rain across parts of northern ireland northern england entering southern parts of scotland uh, northern ireland especially around the county down area it is looking pretty problematic with that rain the warning from the met office is being issued up until 3 a.m a lot of rain expected there now a wet afternoon for central and southern parts of scotland a bit drier for northern ireland but there will be heavy showers spreading northwards sunshine and showers for england and Wales. Winds are particularly strong along the south coast. Gusts up to 70 miles per hour are to be expected. And with the showers today, some of them will be heavy and thundery with a risk of hail, particularly around parts of the West Midlands or westwards. And into tonight, the showers will continue. Some still will be heavy thundery as they move further northwards up towards northern parts of England, Northern Ireland and into parts of Scotland. The rain across Scotland will become confined to the north. So central Scotland becoming dry and clearer and a clear and dry night across parts of Wales and the Midlands. But further south, yet more rain will start to spread through for central, southern and eastern England. And quite a cool night, but mostly frost-free with the brisk winds. The winds will start to ease through tomorrow, though, so it will feel a tiny bit warmer, especially with more of a southerly flow, but it's still going to be quite wet at times. Essentially tomorrow will be a day of sunshine and showers. Most places dry to begin with though but the showers will become more widespread into the afternoon. Again they will be heavy and thundery in places. Uh, there will be the risk of hail as well so some pretty lively downpours to be expected tomorrow. In between there will be some drier and brighter spells and as I said temperatures slightly higher tomorrow. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Cheers, Naz. Time now to go to the papers for a final time this morning. Uh, writer Emma Wolfe and journalist James Floodworth are back. Uh, back gang, guys. thank you. We're going to go to the Labour round in the middle of this and then come back to you, Elisa and Nandy. But James, um, <clears throat> not my favourite pair, but this is interesting. Uh, Times, page 11. The Archbishop of Canterbury has come out in support, as he should do, of Evan Gershwitz, our colleague who is being held in a Russian jail. This is a year today, by the way, and this poor human being has not even had a trial, and it absolutely... Uh, it's, it's an appalling situation, but hardly surprising when you consider what Russia is. Yeah, it's an indictment of Putin's Russia, and Justin Welby, the Archbishop, has called um, 
on people to pray for Evan Gershowitz, who, as you mentioned, has been um, held on false charges of espionage in Russia for it's a year today, I believe. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's a well-meaning it's a well-meaning initiative. Um, I think I would say, I mean, the the pray, yeah, people all, by all means pray, but I think the the the, the way to get Evan out is is to actually help Ukraine to defeat Russia because that's Completely the only, that's that's the only end game for Putin. If if Putin lose, loses the war, um, that's the only way I can see him being uh, in any way removed from power. Um, the problem is at the moment you have it's out of our hands in some ways because Britain has been very good from Boris Johnson to to Rishi Sunak. They have been quite good on on supporting Ukraine. It's it's the GOP and the Republican Party in the US. The That's Trumpist the kind of faction of GOP, which is blocking it. I can't agree with you more. That there's no way that a dictatorship that, that infiltrates everybody's mind is Ooh. actually. Can you? Sorry, can you hold that? Because as we've been discussing, Labour is today launching its local election campaign, kicking off in the West Midlands uh, with the strategy and the results both under close scrutiny. I have to say, because we're edging towards apparently a general election, Nick. Well, we can now speak to the Shadow Secretary for International Development, Lisa Nandy. Good morning. What Hello, should good morning. we expect for, for Starmer and Rayner announcing their local election campaign later today? Well, we think that big promises were made to people across the whole of this country um, four years ago under the guise of levelling up, but very little has materialised. So we're promising to end this decade of, and a half of decline uh, and start to put power back in the hands of working people. It's been a real struggle for a lot of people for far too long. They're facing a huge council tax hike in every part of the country coming in just a few weeks' time. And we think it's time to really empower our local leaders so that people in every part of the country can make a contribution again and that for so many people for whom geography is destiny, we unlock that potential and start to rebuild this country again from the ground up. Lisa, really good to have you on, and I mean that. Um, obviously, the situation in this country, local or general election is that your party has transformed itself in the last four and a half years from the disaster of Jeremy Corbyn to where you are today. Huge lead in the polls. But I just want... I, I know that the viewers and the listeners will still have doubts. Your words are great. Big promises were made. We need to deal with decline. We need to bring people in. Let's just have a look at some of the facts. That's all well and good, Lisa Nandy, but this country is £85 billion in debt. We've got the highest taxation in the last, what, 70 years... Our economy dips in and out of recession. Apparently, everybody is, 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 is up in arms. The truth is, there's no money. And what I need to hear from Labour, apart from non-DOM, which was £3 billion, it's all well and good to talk about. Let's all get together. That's all very nice. How are you going to pay for it, Lisa? Where's the money coming from? Well, the, the, the short, simple and uh, long-term answer is growth, economic growth. If you don't grow the economy, you can't do any of the things that we want to do and people in this country so badly need to see from us. We've set out, as you, as you mentioned, a series of ways in which we think we could make fairer choices in this country, including ending the tax breaks on private schools so that there's a level playing field and so that we can unlock opportunity for children in every walk of life um, and and plans to scrap the non-dom tax status so that we can start to bring down the waiting lists in the National Health Service that are causing people such anguish. But this is the point of today's launch, is that we believe that the only way to genuinely grow the economy is by enlisting the talents of people and businesses in every part of the country. And that's why we're proposing to hand greater powers over housing, energy, transport, Leveling up, then. Leveling up. And Lisa, what level of work have been? Yeah, yeah, exactly that. Elisa, you mentioned they're putting power back into the hands of working people. Starmer is uh, later going to announce a new Take Back Control Act. Can I ask why are Labour co-opting a slogan that was written by Dominic Cummings? Because it spoke to a sentiment that people in every part of the country felt that the world was spinning out of control, that they had very little ability to take charge of their own destiny, whether it was the future of your family, whether they faced the agonising choice to have to move hundreds of miles away to seek work and good wages and opportunity, or whether it was watching your high street decline and your community fall apart 
and the pubs closed and the banks and the buses being cancelled. And we we believe that making good on that promise is still important. This government appears to have given up on that, but we don't we don't believe that that's the case. People deserve it, but it also this country can't survive unless we unlock the talents of people in every I, part. I, I don't I don't country. disagree with that, Lisa, and, and it is a really interesting thing because. Four and a half years ago, the red wall crumbled to Boris Johnson. And the, the accusation to the Labour Party at that point was you've taken the working man and woman's vote for granted and, and it was taken from under you. What I see with Starmer and the Labour Party, being really honest, is I, I'm not quite sure the difference between Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak right now. I'm being completely honest. You, you're 20 points ahead in the polls. He's statesmanlike, everything's fine. When you get to government, if you do, we have to be obviously honest about that, right? What about traditional socialist values? What about traditional Labour policies? Surely all those backbenchers and all those people from left-wing, working-class constituencies are going to be banging down his door saying, hold on a minute, we want a 30% rise. Hold on a minute, we want this, we want that. How is this statesman who paints a very lovely picture going to deal with that in the future? That's what people, I have to be honest with you, that's what people are worried about. That's a fact. Well, I don't think you can question the fact that Keir Starmer has taken charge of the Labour Party and has been prepared to face up to his critics over and over again. The truth is that if you crash the economy, as Liz Truss did uh, just a couple of years ago, it's working class people who pay a very heavy price and are continuing to pay it now. That's why we've said that economic stability um, and economic growth is our number one priority because it's the rock on which everything else is built. That doesn't mean there aren't things that we can do to put power back into people's hands in every part of the country, including through our New Deal for Working People, which will give people rights at work that they've needed desperately for so very long. And, and it's a very core principle as part of the Labour tradition. But growing the economy, economic stability, is absolutely our number one priority, and we make no, no um, apology for that. It's people's money and they haven't got a lot of it and we'll be careful with every penny that we spend. And Lisa, just quickly to ask you, uh, Angela Rayner could be in hot water uh, as the police are set to reinvestigate her over claims about her council tax and potentially breaking electoral law. Uh, do you think this will achieve anything at all? Do you think it's more political spin from the Tories? Well, she's been very clear that she hasn't broken any rules. She's taken legal advice and tax advice, as I understand it, and has said that these allegations are baseless. The Greater Manchester Police originally dismissed the investigation. I understand they've reopened it in response to a Conservative MP, but Angela is absolutely confident that she hasn't broken any of the rules. And it was only a couple of years ago that the Tories decided to launch allegations about breaking rules in lockdown towards Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner during local election campaigns that also turned out to be a nonsense. Angela's absolutely confident she hasn't broken any of the rules and we're behind her. And Lisa, just one final thing, really appreciate it. I've been waiting two years to say this to you, so it's really important. Um, you were a rising star, stood for the leadership. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that you would expect and hope for more than international secretary when you apparently fail. I mean, I'm being serious. You were, you were destined for the top. Are you not a little bit annoyed that you're... I mean, I'm, I'm not disrespecting your brief, but you'd have been hoping for a bigger job, wouldn't you, madam? Um, well, I, I like to say that I've gone from levelling up the country to levelling up the world. I honestly <laughs> couldn't imagine a bigger challenge, but one that I relish. I've been... Uh, you know, every part of the world in the last six months, including in Israel and uh, Palestine, where you can see the consequences for people right across the world, including here in the UK. And the only bit about my job title that I've hated for 14 years has been the word shadow. So I'm very much looking forward to dropping it. I think that's one of the greatest answers I've ever heard and sums up entirely the job that Keir Starmer has done with the Labour Party. So you are saying to me on Talk Today that if you're offered the Foreign Secretary's role, you're going to say, no, I'm happy with International Trade Secretary or International Secretary. Look, I've, I've, taken, I've taken every job that I've been given on the front bench over the last 14 years and seen it as a privilege to serve. But for every one of those 14 years, I've made an argument in the House of Commons, I've walked around the division lobbies and I've lost. I'm determined that we're going to get into government and if there's an opportunity to serve, it'll be an absolute privilege to play a part in rebuilding this country.
That's an amazing answer. Good. When you come off the interview, your PR is going to say good job, Lisa. Thank you very much indeed <laughs> for you. joining us. Thank Lisa you. Nandy, the Shadow Thank Secretary you. of State for International Development. What's a good answer? For now, well, Emma Wolf and James Budworth mm -hmm. were listening into that. What do you make of what Lisa Nandy had to say? Emma? Well, Lisa Nandy is one of those politicians, one of those Labour politicians, um, who I've always had a lot of time for. Yes. I think she's a bright spark. Absolutely. Where's streeting Lisa Nandy? They're the ones to watch. I'm right, and, aren't and, I? And, International and, Development Secretary. Well, she was a star. She, she stood for the leadership. Yeah, I mean, also her point about levelling up is a good one because one of the reasons the Tories did so well in 2019 was because they captured this yep. zeit zeitgeist off the back of Brexit about these left-behind parts of the country. It feels like that's been dropped in recent times. They've forgotten about it, so it's opened a space for Labour to move into. And cancelled, yeah, the HS2 extension and yep. things. But, I mean, the thing is, Jeremy, you make such a good point. It feels like Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer, they're both talking a good game. They're both saying the things we want to hear, which is economic stability, economic boost. Economic How are we growth, paying for investing. it? Investing. A, let's do some long-term investment and planning, finally, because it's all been so short-term. And, and secondly, how are you paying for it? Um, can we move away? Can we go to three, Nick? Is that all right? Absolutely. Uh, this sums up my physical life. So, James, apparently exercise twice a week to cut insomnia uh, risk in middle-aged people. Yeah, I mean, it's so those who exercise regularly are 42% less likely to have difficulty falling to sleep. I mean, it's a bit uh, bare relieves themselves in woods territory, this story. I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? Um, More tired, you're going to sleep better. Yeah. Although it's actually not that true because often, I mean, I have terrible insomnia and I'm doing a lot, so I don't think that it's necessarily true. But it does make the point yeah, that if you're I physically mean, worn out, you're probably you're going to, like to sleep, sleep better than if you've been sitting around on the sofa all day. Uh, and bear yeah. in mind, being 58, an all-nighter now, in my mind, is going through eight hours without getting up to do a pee twice. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's the truth. But it's true, isn't it? You're exercising. Well, you're same running. with the ladies having babies. You know, your bladder gets... You oh, just yes. can't give me that moment at all, can you? No, because you take all of our moments away from us. <laughs> Emma, we're going to move on now <laughs> to the next story. Uh, page 16 of the start. Apparently... What's this? First children... What? So it's the first, first sort of child first that you born, have. First, first born, born children would say that life is harder because of the increased amount of responsibilities that they face. Really? Yeah, well, can I just point out, I don't understand. This, this study is, is uh, sponsored by Burger King. How is this going to help them sell more burgers? So there, <laughs> that's just a random... So older kids have to go to the burger shop for their brothers well, and sisters? Well, obviously, so... older kids feel more hard done by, probably because they do have more responsibilities. They do have other kids to sort of play with and look after. And, you know, so it's a kind of... But, yeah, apparently, I'm, I'm a middle of five, so I don't... Don't know whether that's harder or easier. Oh, that I was explains always, a lot. Yeah, the but, I mean, the cycling, everything. Else, right? For goodness' sake, I, I think that uh, the family position, and well, aren't leaders always first? Wasn't Tony Blair and all the kind of world leaders have always been firstborns? I mean, people have a lot of psychology about the positioning that you are in a bunch of siblings. I imagine your children, six of them, are going to have all sorts of issues. <laughs> but middle, nice. and <laughs> younger Why? children. Well, because everybody has their thing about, oh, it's harder being younger. Oh no, it's harder but, being in the middle. It's harder being. What a load of old rubbish that is. This is this. this you just get on with your life. No, this no, is no, really no, older kids do. They have to help out. You only have older kids so they can babysit for the younger yeah, ones. Exactly. They've got it all licks. What are you laughing at? Are you older, younger? Are you the middle? I'm the eldest. You're I'm the, the eldest. Of course two. you are. Yeah. yeah. I'm oh, the eldest too. But that's different. That's being bully, do you still. bully your siblings? <laughs> no, no. He bullies me. He's oh. I, my younger brother is essentially my older brother. He's way more responsible and, and yeah. Are you, he's uh, running the family I'm business. I'm the oldest. So. I'm oldest of the oldest at four. Four. I was okay. the youngest. Youngest of how many? Two. Well, middle of five is much harder. Is it? Why? You're getting pushed on all. Uh, you're just. It's confusing. I think it's got. I think it's definitely more to do I've with got no you. Clues. Hand me down. Who is the eldest daughter? Because that's often mm. stereotypically mm. Uh, the person. The to mummy who role. The mummy yeah, role falls definitely. on and caring for the, el the older, uh, for the parents. Once that's they get why elderly. I've had all six. Yes, I know. Yeah. So you've got they more can people care for me. To pay and three the side of the coffin at my funeral. I thought was enough. My Ooh, goodness. don't think about that. Right, I really want to talk about Easter eggs, please, because it I'm is so glad. Thursday before Easter. Emma, tell me about Octoplushy. What? OK, so this what? is a limited edition 007 egg, which has been created by Fabergé. It costs £115,000. It is made. It's a collector's piece. There's only 50 made. You don't eat it, then. They're all numbered. It's made of 18 karat yellow gold, green guilloche enamel, diamonds and sapphires. Some people have got more money than sense, haven't they? Oh, I mean, I think it's, it's like a Fabergé egg. You can't eat it. But it's what are you going to do with it? You're just going to 
What, invite people around? Look at my egg. The 007 egg? I don't know. I don't... You're going to put it away after Easter or leave it out all Octoplushy. year? Octoplushy. Mike Graham leaves his Christmas tree out all year because it's too, too... Honestly, it's a true story. It's a miniature one. You can't be bothered to put it away. It leaves it there all year. Right, I want to talk about some Bad real luck. food for a second, James, because... Oh, I've not got... Lo we've not got Go long, on, do it, but though. basically a campaign... Sorry, a, a poster for comedian uh, Ed Gamble. His tour poster has gone out on TFL and it's had one part of it changed. Can you tell me why? Yeah, I mean, because there's a hot dog on it. I mean, it's a bit silly. It seems a bit silly to me. I mean, because junk food ads are banned on the tube. Yeah, but it's not really too. an ad. It's just a picture of a hot dog, half bit, and it doesn't look particularly advertising, so I'm not really sure why that's So this that is what Sadiq Khan guidance. is busy doing when people are being stabbed. Did we see on that train yesterday? I was yeah. actually... Yeah. I was actually in tears after I saw that video. Yep. It was so disturbing. This is what's going on, and he's worrying about hot dogs being we shown. We can criticise a lot. Advert. Knife crime's gone up 54% of the city of London, and we're talking about a hot dog against a cucumber. Come I on. find it quite funny, though, that the cucumber is on the plate, and yet still he's got hot dog sauce all down his T-shirt. But yeah. You had to pull it to shreds. You're right, though. They haven't taken the hot dog sauce off. Well, I'm sure it's going to be a great tour. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank Emma Wolfe and Thanks James Bloodworth. Thank you both. Uh, still to come and talk today, the Times exposes the shocking lack of security in a British prison, including a pandemic of unlocked doors. All of that next. It's talk today, just gone quarter to nine. Come right back. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. Now, you've been getting in touch with us all morning via email, via Twitter, or now X, I suppose, X. and via uh, text message. We asked you, will you vote in your local elections? Mm. Jackson got in touch to say, the current mood of the nation about elections. 
Why bother? It's not going to change anything. I mean, how did we reach this level of voter apathy? By having, I don't know, a bunch of politicians that have behaved in such a way that we don't respect any of them, I right. guess. Thea, if we don't vote, we can't moan. I get this point. I think it's a really salient point. But who do we vote for? We have no committed politicians and none of their policies appeal or appease anymore. That's the other thing. Conviction politicians. We can criticise mm. Thatcher, we can criticise Blair, but they brought people with them. They shared a belief. They had a vision. I don't see that in politics today. Well, I see dour bank managers with no meat on the bone. I'm being serious. Look, we spoke to Lisa Nandy in the last sort of 15 minutes, and you can't possibly say that she's somebody who doesn't come across as someone who cares about constituents. Do you know what I, I mean? completely agree. There demoted, are still people demoted out there. by Starmer though, because she she stood against him. I made the point to her. I would have thought she would be up for a bigger job. Now, I'm going to be honest about this next bit. Slight concerns with the connection, but we're going to give it a go. An urgent investigation is underway following a report by uh, The Times, an excellent re report, actually, exposing the shocking lack of security in a British prison. Well, its reporter went undercover at Her Majesty's prison, Bedford, presumably His Majesty's now, one of the most dangerous in the country. You can watch the full video mm. on The Times website. But first, let's have a taste of what that investigation by Paul Morgan Bentley involved. HMP Bedford is a Category B prison and largely used for high-risk prisoners on remand awaiting trial. There is capacity for 400 prisoners and they can include murderers and rapists. The prison has airport-style security on the front gate, which should mean that everyone entering is searched thoroughly for contraband including drugs and weapons. However, when I arrived for my shifts, I found this was often not happening. For this investigation, the Times decided not to film covertly inside the prison. It's a criminal offence to bring recording equipment into a prison without permission. And there was the risk that had a prisoner got hold of illicit items, there could have been serious consequences. Instead, I decided to keep a video diary. This morning, I arrived at the prison. There was literally no one on security. There was that one OSG at reception, showed her my ID, and then I walked through. Shocking. Well, former prison governor Vanessa Frake joins us now down the line. Vanessa, good morning. These are pretty shocking revelations. Now, as an experienced professional, what did you make of that report? Well, somebody asked me, was I surprised? And unfortunately, I had to say, no, I wasn't. You know, I think um, the... Oh, no, we've uh... Oh, what a shame. Can what we just, shame. can we try and get Vanessa we'll try on and the get phone? Her just back. get her on the phone. Don't, don't worry about that. I mean, you see that, and please do watch that on, on, on the Times website, uh, because I, I, I mean, are we back? Are we trying again? Okay. Vanessa, sorry, you were saying that you were not surprised at all by that investigation, sadly. Right, no. seriously, oh, seriously. Just, just try the phone, that would be great. Not a problem. Um, well, yeah, it, it is, it is shocking, but I know I've spoken to Vanessa before on a previous She's great, show. Yes, yeah. She's fantastic. And it, and sadly, it is not surprising. You would think that um, prisons, high security prisons, should be some of the most secure places in the UK. But that we were talking about the report earlier. And it said that the, the undercover reporter there was not being scanned on his way into the no. prison. He wasn't having his pockets checked, etc. Right, I, do believe gonna, I think we're going on the phone. Aren't we've we? now reconnected. Vanessa, are you back? Yes, so yes, I'm, I'm here. Sorry about that, um, people. No it's problem at, at all. all. So you were saying that, sadly, you weren't surprised by the latest reports? Uh, no, unfortunately not. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where the, the prison service has been in decline over the last sort of 10 years or so. And, um, you know, the, the, the fact that an undercover reporter managed to get into a, a prison and do an OSG's job, operational support grades job, um, over... Um, you know, in, in under three weeks is is just I think outrageous. That's the point I wanted to raise, Vanessa. Let's before we talk about the quality, we haven't got long of the prison. The fact that he could get through the recruitment process, the CRB check didn't happen before he apparently started work there. Yeah, I mean that's just uh, Jeremy. That is just a, a no-no. You know, although a CRB check is is actually only valid on the day that you get it. After that, you know, <laughs> it's it's not worth the paper it's written on. Um, but certainly, background checks should have been done uh, before he was allowed to step foot in the prison. Um, and that is um, a sadness, great sadness to me to see the the prison service in such decline. 
Do you see it changing? Is it about money? I'm sorry we haven't got much time. How can you make it better? Briefly, Vanessa. OK, briefly. Um, well, yes, there needs to be investment in the prison service itself, in the buildings. You know, we've got prisons that are nearly 200 years old, not fit for purpose. We, we need to invest in staff, training, vetting procedures, um, operate. It's all very well putting new enhanced gate um, security stuff in, into jails, but we need the staff to operate them. This is why, you know, searching was such hit, hit and miss, because th there wasn't the staff to operate the new equipment. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's almost sort of doing a bit here and there and actually doing nothing at all. Absolutely, Vanessa. Thank Thanks, you so Vanessa. much for joining us down the phone this morning. And, well, Hayes Recruitment have given us a right of reply. They said, we consistently try to identify ways of improving our processes, and despite procedures being followed in this case, we will be conducting a review of our recruitment process for the supply of these types of roles. You need the to. Ministry of Justice have said the enhanced airport style security in place at HMP Bedford and other closed jails is there solely due to the government's £100 million investment in tough new controls. This includes rolling out x-ray scanners, tightening staff searches and recruiting hundreds more drug detection dogs to make our prisons safer. Patently, it's not working though. Thank you to Vanessa. Former First Minister of Scotland, Alex Salmond, has his say on Sunak's reign and Labour's local election campaign launched in the West Midlands. That after the news at nine and that is next. You're coming right back. Please do. Um. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kingston City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV.
This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning. It's 9 o'clock on Thursday, the 28th of March. It absolutely is. You would talk today. We're on TV, on radio, online, and your smart speaker. These are Thursday morning's top stories. Starmer praises Boris ahead of Labour's local election campaign launch today. Sir Keir says Boris Johnson had the right idea on levelling up, but blames Rishi Sunak for killing the policy. What a mess, yeah? Sewage pours into England's rivers and seas. Check this, my friends. More than 3.6 million hours of spills were recorded. That is double from the previous year and a disgrace. And what the peck. Doing a Scouse accent. As Liverpoolians say their city is being overrun by massive seagulls, we'll ask if the divisive breed of bird is getting more unruly. And rain is the name of the game once again for today and for the rest of the week with strong winds and snow for some this morning too. I'll have the details in the forecast at the end of the programme. And now it's time for your headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. Officials in Baltimore say divers are now in a process of recovery rather than rescue after two bodies were found in a truck in the river where a ship hit a bridge on Tuesday. Rescuers who are facing difficult conditions had been looking for six construction workers who were repairing it when it collapsed. Well, the Maryland governor, Wes Moore, says the impact of what happened will be felt globally. The collapse of the Key Bridge is not just a Maryland crisis. The collapse of the Key Bridge is a global crisis. The national economy and the world's economy depends on the port of Baltimore. Official figures have confirmed that the UK economy fell into recession last year with the worst annual growth since 2009. Gross domestic product, which is a measure of how much we all made as a country, shrank by 0.3% between October and December. Britain's largest water company says its shareholders are refusing to inject the first £500 million of agreed funding unless bills rise. <coughs> Thames Water has billions of pounds of debts and was relying on the extra financial support to keep it afloat. We're being warned about long travel delays with more than 14 million journeys expected over the Easter weekend. The RAC says travel on popular routes could take twice as long as usual. Airports are expecting record passengers and there are engineering works on key rail services too. And the King's Easter message will stress the importance of friendship, especially in times of need. The audio recording will be played at this year's Maundy Thursday service at Worcester Cathedral. The King won't be there after his cancer announcement, but is expected at a mass in Windsor on Sunday. You're up to date with the headlines. We'll have another update at 10 o'clock. Thanks, Sarah, Emily. Those big birds in Liverpool. You're my favourite bird that does the news. <laughs> wow. Why is your Scouse accent just Paula Grady? It's just, you know... Or more li 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 Sarah, the legend. Right. Can I just point out about that water sewage thing, something mm -hmm. Dave just said. We, we sort of started this at 6 o'clock. The response has been phenomenal. Environmentally, it's an utter, utter disgrace. Did you hear in the news there, Nick? Thames Water's got, bit, well, millions and millions of pounds worth of debt. It's looking for 500 million, and the only way to do that is to raise bills. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, in December, Thames Water paid out 37 million pounds in dividends to its shareholders, whilst rising bills and infiltrating our, our waterways with, with what I can only describe as... Effluent. That's Does, it. And that's also, despite the fact that they took payments from the government, just so a lot of those them. payments are actually using dividend pay outs to stakeholders. Right, let's calm down now. Back to our top story this morning. Sir Keir Starmer has unbelievably praised Boris Johnson for his efforts to level up Britain. The Labour leader said the former PM had the right idea, but accused Rishi Sunak, who's getting it from all sides, of killing the policy. Well, Sir Keir is launching his party's local election campaign today, where he will pledge to tackle alienation and powerlessness across much of the country. Let's firstly speak to Talk TV correspondent Oliver Whitfield Mirch in the West Midlands ahead of that Labour launch event. Morning, Oliver. What are we expecting, buddy? What are we expecting from the next Prime Minister, allegedly? Anything exciting? Anything that we could get our teeth into at all? Hold on to your hats, Jeremy, because we are expecting more of the same. And who would have thought that Sakia Starmer would be praising his former political foe, Boris Johnson, for the levelling up agenda. But that's exactly what he and the Deputy Labour leader, Angela Rayner, have been doing in that opinion piece for The Times. But they've done it not just to say that they want to have their own levelling up agenda in something that they say is going to be taking back control. They've done it as well to try to sow divisions between Boris Johnson's supporters and the supporters 
of the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak because in the next sentence after that praise was a line that Rishi Sunak had killed off levelling up when he was the Chancellor. Now, they also remember a few weeks ago that there was praise given by Sakia Starmer for another Conservative Prime Minister, former Prime Minister, Maggie Thatcher. And it seems like what's happening here is that the Labour Party is not only trying to sow those divisions, but they're trying to woo potential Conservative voters into switching their allegiances and to vote for Labour instead. Unbelievable, but that's the state of play that we are currently in. And you can expect this to go forward all the way through this local election campaign, right up until the 2nd of May. The Labour Party says that they will instead be giving more powers to local leaders because they'll have the chances then to make decisions on the things that matter most to their local areas. But there's been no mention of how much extra money that potentially might mean for local areas and indeed how far that devolution will go because they're saying now, that would also go as far as planning applications and planning decisions, but in the next breath we're hearing that actually that would lie with the more regional mayors. So in, potentially you'd end up in a situation where you'd vote for a Labour councillor, a Labour MP, but you could have a mayor of a different political party deciding what gets built where. The Labour Party is undoubtedly going into this with a spring in its step. The polls have showed that Labour is at least 20 points clear of the Conservatives when it comes to the polls that are run very often in this country. But it's not all a bed of roses in the Labour Party at the moment, especially not for the Deputy Leader Angela Rayner. Today's her birthday and she was given somewhat of a terrible present yesterday when Greater Manchester Police said that they will be reassessing their decision not to take any action over her information that was given out whether her uh, council house should have been sold and paid for and, and whether she should have paid capital gains tax. Angela Rayner has been speaking on the morning broadcast round this morning and she insists she has done nothing wrong potentially later on today when that speech happens here in the West Midlands we'll be able to ask her some questions ourselves. Amen. Thank you so much Oliver Thanks, Wilson, Ollie. Mirtich in the West Midlands where well, we're joined now by former First Minister of Scotland and the leader of Alpa Alex Salmond. Good morning Alex. Good morning Nicola. Do you think that Starmer can get the Midlands and perhaps the rest of the country on side in the local elections? Oh it probably. The, I mean you say wasn't American politics if you could uh, walk and chew gum at the same time, then you're a, a viable candidate. As long as uh, Sir Keir Starmer walks and chews gum, then he'll win the local elections and indeed he'll win the general election. Not so much for any of his outstanding attributes, but because of what he's facing. I know exactly, because I know you well, what you're going to say to this. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, Nick and I have sat here and we've watched Rachel Reeves, who allegedly up well, there women will become the first uh, female uh, Chancellor of Great Britain. Uh, she quoted Margaret Thatcher yesterday or rather today, Starmer was going to quote Boris Johnson. I don't see much difference between these two parties. There's no money. I don't see any meat on the bone for the Labour Party. And I just seriously sit here and think this is down to 100% the sheer incompetence and chaos of the Tory party. I don't even think he'd be near if there hadn't been what there'd been. I'm not hearing anything new. There's no money, Alex, is there? Well, absolutely correct. And, and there's no great dividing line in policy between the parties. There's no inspiration. There's no crusade. Uh, and uh, and that's the way it is. But then there doesn't have to be. He doesn't ha All he has to do is to stand upright and not fall over. Instead, the, the stuff on Boris Johnson today, you know, people say, oh, why is he quoting Boris Johnson? He's quoting Boris Johnson, so it's a news line, because he's got nothing of policy <laughs> substance to say. So in a policy vacuum, you do something like, oh, let's quote Boris Johnson. Now, you might get a little bit of flack in it, but basically it'll, it'll create the news line uh, and upset the uh, Conservative Party. So in the absence of a <coughs> policy initiative, then what you do is you say something that will capture a headline. It's interesting, that. Uh, moving on now to Scottish politics, mm. Alex. Uh, Hamza Yousaf has been described as a weak leader. Do you think that's a fair assessment? I mean, he's... He's, well, let, let's use a Scottish phrase. He's not set the heather on fire uh, over the last year. I mean, he, he's done... I mean, he's done one half of what he had to do 
reasonably well, not, not as well as it could have been. And that was to clear out the, the total poisonous, toxic agenda he was left by Nicola Sturgeon. So he's cleared out uh, self-identification. Total, complete and utter nonsense. And that's no longer, uh, they're not going to longer pursue it. He's cleared out, there was something called the Bottles Return Scheme. <laughs> which yeah, was, yeah, yeah. They, he let the Green Party handle it, which was, you know, born disaster. Uh, so he stopped that. He was going to have a fishing ban, which, he, which was ridiculous around the coastal communities. So, so he's, he's cleared out a number of the, the more ridiculous policies that he was left. Having said that, you know, he's kept in a hate crime bill which is now being introduced, introduced on the 1st of April, <laughs> rather rather, uh, rather appropriately, I would have said. And, and that's got disaster written all over it. Would it be it, fair to say, Alex, that the problem for Hamza uh, Yusuf um, uh, is, is that he is 100% associated with a woman who has left that party that she used to be in charge of in disgrace, where hundreds of thousands of well-meaning Scots who wanted independence have paid their subscription fees and have seen what's happened. I mean, the, the seismic fall of her and her husband and that party in Scotland is unbelievable from where it was. You've got to admit that. Well, it's not been the greatest time to be a continuity candidate, which is what he announced. Uh, so he cleared out some of the, mm. the legacy, but what he didn't do was either make a, a great show of it. I mean, if, you, mm. if you're doing that, then what you should say is, look, I'm clearing off all this because the new agenda is economic growth, or I'm set on a new agenda. He didn't do that. Nor has he, like, rather like Keir Starmer, has he created his own distinctive policy agenda. Absolutely. Now, for Starmer, it doesn't matter, mm. because he's facing a, you know, a discredited Tory government, which is going to get swept out of office. For, for Hamza, of course, he's facing the, the Labour Party. And yet, in a lot of his announcements, he keeps talking about how it's going to be a contest between the SNP and the Tories. Well, clearly it isn't. It's a contest in the vast majority of seats between the SNP and the Labour Party. Yeah. And you can't pretend to people we're going to beat the Tories when you've got the, the, the elephant in the room, which is the Labour Party threatening lots and lots of SNP seats. So he's got to get his act together. And above all, he's got to reignite the, the fire of independence to motivate nationalist voters. They want to hear how he's going to get Scottish independence not uh, what he's not doing or how he's going to hammer the Tories. Very interesting indeed. Well, I want to talk to you about another yeah, issue is now because yeah. there's reports that three quarters of Scots back an assisted dying law. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Scottish Parliament, one of the very good things it's done, I think this is the third time it's considered this legislation in the 25 years of the Parliament. And when I was First Minister, the redoubtable Margaret MacDonald, I don't know if you remember Margaret, she was a great legendary figure in Scottish politics, unfortunately passed now, but, but she was a great figure, an independent nationalist member of the Scottish Parliament. And she introduced it about, uh, ooh, about 12 years ago as a, a private member. Well, she herself was suffering from Parkinson's disease, and it's fairly later stages when she introduced the, the bill, so it made it particularly poignant. Uh, and now uh, Liam McCarthy, who's a, a, an MP, an MSP for the for Orkney, for the Orkney Islands in the, in the north of Scotland, has introduced it again. This time it looks like it's going through. And public opinion has now moved very substantially from, from 50 years ago. The one thing I would say is that this, the detail of this has to be absolutely, absolutely. right. Mm -hmm. Because while most of us w would say in response to you know, a, a number of well-publicised cases, the Axel Ransom, for example, would be example of somebody is fully compass mentis and they're facing a terminal illness which is going to involve agony, pain, distress and a whole range of disabilities and they make a conscious choice that look I'd rather go with dignity then people would say yeah that, that sounds I, right. I, th I think the trouble is of course unless you get this absolutely right yeah. of course. it could be subject I think to you can I think you can pass it I think legislating is a different matter but I will say this I think it's an eye-opener I think it's a debate. We've talked about Dame Esther Ranson down here wanting to have that debate. Starmer says there will be one. Of course, he's promised that because he wants to win the election. But the Scots are leading the way. The Scottish, I think it's a debate that needs to be The people of Scotland are often extremely pro progressive and they do lead the way for, for legislative. The, the, the Scots are progressive. They are. They there's, are. There's the number of social legislation. There's the, the smoking in public places. Yeah. Culturally, and, socially, and my predecessors, the minimum pricing for, for alcohol yeah. in my term of office in this. And to be fair, the Scots Parliament, it was debated last time extremely well, extremely courteously, yeah. civilly, and this time it's I, a, it's I, a, it's I understand a, the debates have been conducted in the same fashion. It's Good. a discussion that undoubtedly needs to be had, but as you said, in the right way, 
and done in a in a sympathetic and logical way mm. so that people don't just put emotion into it and can make the right decision. Mm. Alex, it's always an absolute pleasure. We, we, we sort of, as usual, run out of time. Um, when do you think the election will be in this country? Oh, as late as possible. I mean, uh, listen, if we could get away with... Uh, waiting to Burns night on the 25th of January next year, he would do it. And, of course, people say, oh, nobody will vote in the, you know, the deep midwinter. But, of course, that's exactly what the Conservative Party wants. Do they they'll wait till the end of January? They, they shall wait till the... Ab I think it'll be November, but, I mean, mm -hmm. they wait till the absolute end. And if nobody goes to the polls, then I can tell you, Rishi Sunak will be absolutely delighted. Good man, Alex. Always Thank great to have you on. Thank so you so much, Alex right. Salmon, for joining us this morning. Well, still to come, after Liverpool declared it's overrun with aggressive seagulls... XL gullies. ..we'll be debating if they're a vicious nuisance or an important part of British wildlife. This is wow. Talk Today. It is quarter past nine. Stay with us. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to your talk today. What is it? 9.20. Alex and Kev from 9.30. Jake Berry here from 10 o'clock. Now, the city of Liverpool is, I love this, is reportedly being overrun by gigantic seagulls that locals are dubbing. Excel gullies! Well, it's thought that the birds are flocking to the city to feast on the growing <laughs> amount of discarded litter and food waste. This morning we're asking, are seagulls our friends or our foes? Well, joining us this to debate this goodness. is wildlife consultant Kevin Newell, who believes that society needs to learn how to live side by side with our infamous feathered friends. Even when they nick your sandwich? Well, quite. And meanwhile, self-proclaimed seagull-phobe, actor and impressionist Francine Lewis thinks that the nation's most hated bird doesn't need our protection. We need protection from them. Ladies first, shoot, Francine. I'm with you one million percent. 
<laughs> they're vicious. They're vicious. Um, nobody wants a flock of seagulls around them when they're at seaside um, on the pier. But the thing is now, they're not only at our seashores, they're now inland. And this is what the terrifying thing is. Um, they are attacking people. You can defend seagulls as much as you like. They are attacking people even in their own homes, as in in their back gardens. They've been known to take people's pets, um, attack children when they're having a, an innocent ice cream, walking in their, you know, going along in their push chairs, people having fish and chips by the sea. We can't enjoy it because of the fear of these vicious animals and they need to be culled. I'm not saying, let me just say, I'm not saying we have to get rid of all seagulls, but we do need to reduce the population. Kevin, what I definitely you say? think this is a problem. And look, people are in Liverpool, they can't even walk around without the fear of a massive big bird attacking them. It well, is and really the scary. Quite a lot in Liverpool. Uh, Kevin, what's your response to that? Are seagulls actually part of a very delicate ecosystem and we humans are the ones who've actually ruined it? What's that all about? Uh, yeah, they totally are. They, they don't need culling at all. Um, they're not vicious birds. You know, I've, I've helped rear and raise hundreds of gulls in the past. I work with large gull colonies all, all over Scotland and, in, in, and uh, in England too. And I've never had a gull be vicious to me. Now, what people need to understand is you don't get monstrous large gulls. You get gulls which are the size of gulls. They don't grow any bigger than gulls are meant to grow. Yeah, they may take food, but it's not an act of aggression. It's for them, survival. And the reason why I they are say, in our town is most hilarious. Man, man, if I nicked your lunch, you'd say that was aggressive. Uh, yeah, if you did that, human on human, but if it's a gull trying to survive, Jeremy, of course they're going to try and take an opportunity where they can. We've pushed them out of their natural nesting sites. We've, we've pushed them into urban areas, and they're there because we're wasteful and we create mess in our cities. If, if anything... You know, uh, gulls actually help keeping our cities out a bit cleaner by picking up the rubbish we drop everywhere. As for gulls uh, being on the being on the beach on the coast, that's where they live. Mm. If you go into the environment yeah, of uh, an animal, they're, 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 they're inland now and they're nesting on people's rooftops and on their porches. There was actually a case of a, a man who was held hostage by um, seagulls every time he came out of his front door because oh, they were trying to defend their chicks and they I... actually viciously attacked him and, and left severe marks all over his head. Um, could, could you know, you this is a serious situation. I would be amazed if he was actually held hostage. I think that's just scaremongering talk there, I'm afraid to say. Girls, yeah, they will protect the young, but, like, if someone came in into where you, where you're... If you've got children, where your children were... You would not defend those children, right? And the gulls are just doing the same. They only breed in our cities for a few months of the year. Most of them, um, especially on the uh, the west coast, the lesser blackback gulls will migrate down to Spain and Portugal and Africa and only come back uh, to Let breed. Me get just this. For those Let few me months. get this. Hold on a minute. Let me get this absolutely straight. You think they're wonderful, lovely creatures, and you, Francine, think they actually held people hostage. That's what we're dealing with here. Yes. <laughs> Well, I've got yes, a comment and, and, for you. And they also harm our pets. They're coming into people's back gardens, you know. It's a really serious matter, and we need to do something to reduce the population of this vicious, vicious animal. Well, you're very kind to have come on, Nick. We have to wrap it up. If you are in Liverpool and you see a big bird coming for you, run for your life. That's what I'd say. <laughs> Rory, I love Rory. Rory says to me, the tourists are more of a bloody nuisance than the seagulls where I live. There we go. Thank the you, Gary. They're great birds. Learn, yes. to, learn to live Don't... and love them. No, they're not. They're a nuisance. Get off. Oh, thank thank you, you, Kevin go. Newell and Francine Lewis there. But... <laughs> <laughs> That's all from us today. Sorry, it's just that that, that seagull stealing that food. David Where... Bond and Rosie Wright here tomorrow morning uh, at six o'clock. Uh... It is Good Friday tomorrow. Have a wonderful Easter. I will be back on Monday. Ease off on holiday. Kev and Alex are up next. Have there a good are. day. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello, it's looking pretty rainy out there for this afternoon. Sunshine and showers for most places across England and Wales with strong winds, particularly along the south coast where there's a warning from the Met Office gusts up to 70 miles per hour there. And uh, rain moving northwards across parts of northern England, northern Ireland and over towards Scotland by the end of the day. Temperatures are around average for the time of year, up to around 10 or 11 degrees Celsius, but not feeling mild at all because of the strength of those winds and those hefty showers. Now, some of those showers will be heavy and thundery with the risk of hail and they continue need to move northwards overnight up towards parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England, Southern Scotland and the rain across Scotland will become confined to the far north. It will become somewhat drier for Wales and the Midlands, some parts of Eastern England but by the early hours of the morning there'll be yet more rain heading to central, southern and eastern parts of England. And then through tomorrow we do it all again. We see areas of rain or showers moving northwards across parts of the UK and eastwards. Again, some of those showers are likely to be heavy and thundery, particularly across parts of the south and east of England and Wales. Winds will be slightly lighter, so it will feel slightly milder for tomorrow, but it will still be quite a blustery day. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right too. Quite right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale, and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, you put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Then I don't 